There we go. Um, to bid you all a very good welcome, I uh, give the floor to uh, Jan van Gemert. Yes, welcome. Uh, whenever time zone you're in, uh, we're no longer two to the power of five participants. So it's good that we went over that, but uh, welcome to the visual inductive priors workshop. So visual priors, I think the best example is the convolution operator. And um, well, if you assume that objects can appear anywhere in the image, that means that indeed objects can appear anywhere. And by doing convolution, it means that you don't have to learn these location specific filters. Now, of course, there's a bit of self attention going on. Um, people are taking patches and saying no convolutions needed anymore. There's even all, all MLP. But in very, very recent papers, the convolution is fighting back. So it's making kind of a, um, a return to uh, the forefront of vision. Um, and of course, there's other uh, priors that we uh, can exploit as well. Um, Equivariance, for example, uh, geometry, gravity, all kind of things that uh, you can exploit. And all the things that you can exploit beforehand, of course, you don't have to learn these things from data. And that leads to data efficiency. And that's the topic of the workshop. Good. Now, let me talk a bit about who organized this workshop. Um, so lots of work is being done, has been done by uh, Robert Jan and Attila. So Robert Jan Brandjes and Attila Lengel. There are uh, PZ students from uh, Delft. There's also uh, Osman. Um, he is a former PZ student, <laughs> and Marcos, who was a visiting PZ student in Delft. Negus has just started as an assistant professor, and um, we're happy to have Matthias aboard. And myself, I'm also from uh, Delft University of Technology. Now the schedule. Um, oh, sorry, first some statistics. Uh, indeed, we have 13 submissions in our paper track. 10 of them uh, we accepted. Uh, only if you're yeah, uh, out of scope, I think, was one of the main reasons for being uh, not accepted. We have three oral presentations of the, of the, uh, of the work that is probably most relevant to uh, other people. And everybody will present the poster. So you can talk to uh, everybody there. Um, and then we have a challenge where we have 22 participants across five tasks. The schedule is on our website. Um, so uh, it's here also, but it's a bit small. So please uh, check it on our website. And um, I think now Attila will uh, say a little bit more about uh, the challenges. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for your attention. So we were, ah, 42. Okay, we went from uh, two to the power of five to 42 to another magic number. Yes, thanks very much, Jan. Um, so I will introduce the, the challenges. The, the challenges are uh, this year, uh, they have been organized in collaboration with uh, Synergy Sports. So before talking about the challenges, I would like to give the word uh, very briefly to Davide so he can uh, say something about uh, Synergy Sports. Thank you, Attila. Um, so just a few words about Synergy Sports, uh, the company I work for. for. Um, so we offer two main services. Uh, one is the autonomous production system that uh, autonomously captures, produces, and live streams sports events without human intervention um, from a set of fixed camera that uh, we installed in the venues. And, and then the other side of the company uh, has a login service that um, is used to produce game um, and to um, create up to 50,000 data points per game. So we have a lot of data to, to process. So we have a long history of collaborations with universities. Uh, we share data, we found PhD programs. In our research lab for which I'm part of, uh, we currently have um, uh, three PhD students working on deep learning based solutions for computer vision. And uh, um, so we decided to contribute for this uh, workshop uh, since uh, we share the vision and objectives uh, promoted here. Now we are happy to have contributed to the Eastern segmentation and re-identification challenges that will be presented uh, um, soon. And uh, we provided uh, basketball data captured uh, from our uh, autonomous production system. 
So we hope we could uh, keep continuing um, to contribute uh, to this workshop in the coming years uh, as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Davide. So now it's uh, it's time to introduce the challenges. Um, this year we have uh, featured five different tasks. Um, namely, we had the, the image classification where people had to train a classifier on a subset of ImageNet. Um, we had the object detection uh, challenge where um, we used the Delft Pikes data set. Um, then we had the instance segmentation, not semantic segmentation challenge, uh, where we had uh, a, a beautiful data set uh, from uh, Synergy Sports. Uh, then there was action recognition, uh, where we uh, again used a subset of the Kinetics 400 data set. And uh, the re identification challenge, where we again had a data set from Synergy Sports. Um, so for each challenge, we had numerous uh, participants on CodeLab. And the final ranking is based on the teams that have submitted uh, the reports where they detailed their challenge solutions. And this year, we also had a jury prize for the most, most interesting method. So that's not necessarily the method that scored uh, highest, but that we found most uh, interesting. So let's uh, start with uh, the classification challenge. Uh, the winner of this year's uh, classification challenge is the group from uh, is the team from Alibaba Group. So uh, congratulations! Um, and the jury prize uh, went to the group from uh, Nanyang Technological University and Panasonic R and D Center from Singapore. Um, then for object detection, uh, the winning team is from uh, the winning teams are from. Uh, School of the School of Artificial Intelligence and uh, Shidian University, and uh, from Ali, Alibaba Group, um, due to some um, uh, confusion about the uh, challenge deadlines, we decided to merge two different rankings. So that's that's the reason that for some challenges we have uh, two winners, um, and the jury prize for object detection went to uh, Zhang Yuki from. Being on international smart city. Now, the funny thing about uh, this submission is that um, uh, they actually discovered a bug in the Cocoa object detection evaluation API, and that's the reason why they were able to score very high on our uh, ranking. So we thought that was uh, quite an interesting way to uh, become uh, first on the leaderboard. Um, <clears throat> then for instance segmentation. Um, <clears throat> The winning team is from the Department of Com Computer Engineering uh, and the uh, Kumoh National Institute of Technology. Congratulations again. And the jury prize um, went uh, to the same team. For action recognition, uh, the winners are from the Center for Research and Computer Vision, uh, University of uh, Central Florida, Le Tourneau University, and also ByteDance Inc. Congratulations. And the jury prize went to one of the winners, um, namely from the uh, UCF and the Tourneau University. And finally, for the re-identification challenge, uh, we have the team from NetEase Games AI Lab uh, that became first. And the jury prize uh, went to uh, the team from Fudan University and Might won. So uh, congratulations to all challenge winners. Um, the top three finalists for each challenge will uh, receive a signed certificate uh, from us. And uh, please stay tuned for the workshop report that we will write and will publish on Archive, where we will provide more details about each of the challenge submissions. Um, yeah, that's it about the challenges. And now I give the word back to uh, Robert John. Thank you very much, Attila. A nice overview of... Uh... A lot of work that went into these competitions for a lot of people all over the globe. Uh, so thank you very much again for participating. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's move on. Um, the uh, first part after the introduction of our uh, of our program is uh, invited talks. We have um, uh, two sets of invited talks. We have two talks now and two talks towards the end of the program. Um, and uh, the first talk that we're starting with is actually a talk by Dr. Chelsea Finn. Uh, I think she is here, so I'm going to ask her if she can maybe unmute and, and show herself. I'm trying not to say that very rudely. Hello, hello. hello. Great. So let me uh, let me please introduce you to our guests. 
Uh, Dr. Chelsea Finn is an assistant professor in computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford and a research scientist at Google Brain. She achieved a PhD in computer science at UC Berkeley with Sergey Levine and Peter Abel. And uh, she achieved many awards, including the 2020 Intel Rising Star Faculty Award and the 2020 Microsoft Faculty Fellowship Award. Um, her interests include, uh, I cite from the website, a meta learning algorithms that can enable fast few shot adaptation in both visual perception and deep reinforcement learning. Um, so we're very pleased to host her for, the, for this talk. Please, the floor is yours. I Great, think you, for the introduction. yes, once I stop sharing, I think you should be able to share your screen. If you so wish to, yes. Great. So um, today I'll be talking about some of our work on inductive biases for robustness. And I'll be giving examples both in computer vision domains as well as um, how these same sorts of inductive biases can be also used in settings outside of uh, computer vision. So uh, the motivation is that we know that machine learning works quite well. We've seen examples where uh, machine learning can be deployed for real world applications, but it works really well in the training distribution. And there are a lot of scenarios where the training distribution and the test distribution don't exactly match. And so the goal of producing more robust models is to allow them to be able to generalize to the kinds of test distributions we might see in the real world. Now, uh, why might this matter? Um, let's look at a couple examples of distribution shift. Uh, one example is maybe you uh, want to try to make the internet a better place and you want to be able to predict whether a comment is toxic or not toxic. Um, it turns out that if you train a classifier on this task, you can get around 92.2% test accuracy, which sounds great. But then if you dig into the details and look at actually how well it performs on different uh, comments mentioning different demographics, you see that the accuracy drops substantially to comment um, for non-toxic comments that are mentioning the black demographic. And this means that if your population shifts um, or you wanna deploy it on a platform that has a different population, um, a different population or different demographic ratios, uh, your system might perform substantially worse than the original system. Um, as another example, uh, Maybe you want to be able to predict the, the activities of different molecules um, and you get a 34.4% average precision on test molecules from the training scaffolds. If you evaluate the same model on molecules from held out scaffolds, your precision drops substantially to around 26.8%. Um, these are two examples of the um, data sets that are in the WILDS data set, which uh, really tries to emphasize distribution shifts that appear in real world applications ranging from these examples to ecological conservation, to medical imaging. Um, and if you're interested in these kinds of problems, I'd really encourage you to take a look at the benchmark and Pangwe and Chiori are also um, very eager to hear from the community about um, different data sets that you have that exhibit distribution shift or any feedback that you have on the data set. Um, so here are a couple examples of the kind of distribution shift that we might care about. Um, now, what I'd like to focus on in this talk is how we can train models that have greater robustness to distribution shift. Um, now, of course, ultimately in settings where we can do it, my favorite solution to this problem is to try to leverage data from other tasks or other domains. Um, so for example, um, in a robotic scenario, we found that we can have a small amount of robot data and take a ton of human data and get a much more robust model that can generalize to different environments and different objects. Um, by jointly training on these prior data sets. Um, we can also, in some settings, try to selectively train on prior tasks or prior data sets um, rather than just training on everything jointly. We also have work where you try to kind of learn um, priors and transfer those priors from the previous data when trying to learn our new task. Um, and so all of these are examples of trying to leverage um, data, essentially try to extract other kinds of inductive biases from um, prior data. Um, so this is, this is arguably my favorite solution if we can actually do this. Um, however, there are gonna be scenarios where you don't have suitable prior data. And so what I'd like to focus on in this talk is what if you don't have the suitable prior data, can we still um, design inductive biases, ideally inductive biases that are fairly general, but that allow us to acquire models that are more robust. Great, so I'm gonna look at two different kinds of robustness. The first will be robustness to spurious correlations. 
um, such as spurious correlations between the category and the background. And second, uh, we're going to look at robustness in scenarios where you have a lot of class imbalance. Uh, great, so let's start with spurious correlations. Um, one approach for handling distribution shift is to use this idea of being pessimistic or conservative. Um, and really the key idea here is that you want to assume that the distribution is going to shift within some ball and then prepare for the worst shift within that set of possible distribution shifts. Um, and one name for this is uh, referred to as distributionally robust optimization, where you assume that you have some uncertainty set U that's near your empirical distribution P, and you optimize for the worst case distribution under your uncertainty set about how the distribution shift is going to change. Um, now, this is a really, really nice framework for thinking about distribution shift. Um, you can note that adversarial training is a special case of this, um, although adversarial training usually doesn't produce models that are robust to natural distribution shifts. Um, other common choices for this uncertainty set could be something like Wasserstein DRO or, um, or CVAR DRO that consider distribution shifting over portions of the data, um, or was referred to as group DRO, where you um, assume that the distribution is going to shift uh, by placing uh, mass on different domains or groups in your data set. Now, overall, this is a really beautiful framework and uh, also very principled. You can say something about how well the model is going to be able to handle certain kinds of distribution shifts. However, it also has some shortcomings, which is that if you look at uh, Wasserstein and Group DRO, these models end up having a very large uncertainty set. And as a result, they end up being too pessimistic about how the distribution is going to shift. On the other hand, group DRO actually can work quite well, including for spurious correlations, like I'll mention on the next slide. However, it requires you to label the, all of your training data points with the domain or the group underlying, um, underlying how the distribution is going to shift. And this is something that's going to be quite expensive in terms of um, providing like additional labels for your entire training data set. Um, so how well do these methods actually do when you evaluate them on robustness to spurious correlations. So we're going to look at four different data sets um, to try to evaluate this. The first is the water birds data set, where the bird in the foreground, which is you're trying to classify whether it's a land bird or a water bird, um, it, spurs, it spuriously correlates with the background, either being a water background or a land background. Uh, the second example will be the celeb bay data set, where we want to predict hair color, which spuriously correlates with gender. The third example will be uh, predicting entailment um, or, or contradiction, and the spurious correlation will be whether there is a negation in the sentence. And then the last example will be the uh, content moderation or the toxicity prediction that I mentioned before. And in particular, if we train models on this data set and we look at the average accuracy and also look at the accuracy on the worst group, and what I mean by the worst group is the um, the the scenario where the, um, the group, I mean essentially the, the background or the spurious attribute um, grouped with the label. Um, what we see is first with ERM, we see a big drop in performance when you go from average accuracy to worst group accuracy. And this means that, for example, when you see land birds on water backgrounds, the performance is much worse than when you see land birds on land backgrounds. For group DRO, we see that it actually does much better. It substantially improves this worst group accuracy. But of course, this requires group labels during the training process. And uh, on the other hand, we see that joint DRO doesn't require group labels, but it really shows very little gains over empirical risk minimization. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to develop a method that can produce models that are robust to spurious correlations without having to require labels of all of these spurious attributes on the training data set. Okay, um, so we tried to initially investigate why joint DRO doesn't work for spurious correlations. And we found that in general, it's less directed at the minority groups than group DRO. And in particular, if we look at the amount that it upweights the minority groups, like the water birds on land backgrounds, we see that it initially prioritizes them fairly highly, but over the course of training ends up not prioritizing nearly as highly as it should be. 
And so this led us to an approach that where we try to essentially really identify the examples where spurious correlations don't hold and then prioritize those examples. And so in particular, the high level approach is gonna be first, we're gonna to try to automatically identify the examples in the data set where the spurious correlations don't hold, like water bird on land background, and then prioritize those examples. Um, now this is quite simple, uh, but of course the, the key challenge is this first stage of how do we actually identify examples where the spurious correlation doesn't hold so that we can prioritize them. And what we can remember is that the empirical risk minimization model performs very poorly on these examples. And as a result, what we could do is we could train an ERM model on the data set and take the examples that it classifies incorrectly and assume that those are the ones where the spurious correlations doesn't hold. Um, and this leads to an algorithm that's quite simple. First, we'll train a model with ERM, standard training. Second, we will compute an error set, which corresponds to the examples that the model misclassifies. Then we're going to upweight the examples from this error set in our training data set, and ultimately train a final model that is trained on this data set that has these examples upweighted or upsampled. And that's it. Um, so we'll refer to this approach as just train twice in the sense that we're just gonna be training models twice, first with ERM and then with the misclassified examples upweighted. Great, um, and so we'll compare this approach to empirical risk minimization, joint DRO, um, also group DRO, um, as well as learning from failure, which is a representative recent approach that has pretty strong results on these kinds of data sets. Um, and it's worth noting that all of the methods here are going to be tuned with respect to the worst group loss. Um, this means that we are actually going to require annotations of the spurious attribute on all of the validation set, but not on the training data set. Great, um, and so what we see is that um, first, this kind of just train twice approach gets a 6% improvement in worst group accuracy over the best performing prior method. It also provides fairly substantial gains over empirical risk minimization around 10% or more. Um, and then we also see that on, on one data set, JGT is actually comparable to group DRO, even though it doesn't actually require group labels at all. Cool, so um, then we can actually look into the data points that JTT identifies and we can see that if we measure the portion of that error set that corresponds to minority examples, we see that um, the portion of the error set is actually much larger than the empirical rate, which suggests that it is indeed actually identifying examples where this various correlation doesn't hold. Great, and then we can also compare the way that JGT upweights compared to joint DRO, like I showed before. And what we're seeing here is the orange line corresponds to JTT upweighting throughout training, whereas the blue line corresponds to precision and recall of uh, CVAR DRO upweighting. And we see that overall, um, JTT will, is prioritizing and upweighting the minority data points much higher than, um, than joint DRO. And this probably explains why it's doing much better. Great, uh, so the takeaway here is that we can achieve much greater robustness to spurious correlations by essentially just prioritizing data points that are difficult for a standard model. Now, can we do even better? Um, in JTT, the kind of key approach was to identify the points and then upweight them. But one thing that we might notice is that this upweighting approach, it can encourage it to prioritize and look at the data points without the spurious correlations, but it's not really enforcing the model to pay attention to one feature or another. And what we wanna be able to do is essentially enforce that the model discards the spurious information in its representation. And if we can enforce this, then we should be able to get even greater robustness. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, um, take data points in our data set. Um, we know the label for each of these data points because they're in the training data set. We don't know the spurious attribute, but we can infer the spurious attribute um, or whether the attribute is kind of spuriously correlated or not by using um, a trained ERM model. And then what we'll do is we will encourage the model to learn a representation that 
has a similar representation for items with the same label, but different spurious attributes and push apart the representation of, um, of examples with different labels and, um, and the same spurious attribute as the anchor example. So this is, we can do this with a contrastive learning approach where we have an anchor, a positive and a negative. The anchor is going to be kind of one of the majority data points. The positive will be something with the same label and a different attribute. And uh, the negative will be an example with a different label and the same, attribute, uh, the same spurious attribute as the anchor. And with the contrastive objective, we can essentially, this sort of contrastive objective will encourage it to represent the core label information and discard the spurious attribute information. Cool, and then if we evaluate this in comparison to JTT, we see that it um, provides the two to seven improvement over, two to seven percent improvement over JTT in the worst group accuracy on two out of three data sets. Um, on civil comments, it, it ends up performing quite similarly. Um, and we also see that on all of the data sets, it bridges nearly all of the gap between JTT and group zero. Cool, um, so we can e get even greater robustness than the simple just train twice approach by actually using this contrastive objective on the identified data points. Great, um, so now that I've talked about how we can use this sort of inductive bias of prioritizing hard data points in order to be more robust to spurious correlations. Next, I'll talk about um, a different kind of robustness where we have imbalance in our class distribution. And in particular, uh, there are a lot of examples where you have long tail distributions. This actually isn't very well reflected in standard data sets like ImageNet because typically when people construct the data sets, they try to make it uh, easier and nicer for machine learning by balancing the data and discarding categories where you don't have a lot of data. Um, of course, a very common approach, even if you do have a long tail distribution, is to just reweight or resample the data up to the uniform distribution. This would be kind of analogous to the approach that I mentioned before. However, even then, uh, models often don't perform well on the classes that, that are poorly represented in the data. And so we wanted to try to understand why deep networks will actually fail on the tail of the distribution, even in the case where you're resampling the data up to the uniform distribution. And so we formulate a hypothesis, which is that in long tail distributions or in classification problems in general, there are a lot of things that you want to be invariant to, like background or lighting and that sort of stuff. And we're hypothesizing that these class agnostic invariances we hypothesize that the model is learning these invariants as well on the head of the distribution where it has a lot of data, but it's not transferring these invariances from the head of the distribution to the tail of the distribution. And as a result, it's not generalizing to examples in the tail because it's not invariant to these basic things like lighting, background, and so forth. And if this were true, this would lead to poor generalization on the tail. So, uh, fortunately, this is actually a hypothesis that we can actually test empirically. And so what we'll do is we're going to create a synthetic long tail data set that is invariant to some transformation T. And then we're going to train models and, and evaluate their invariance to this particular known transformation. And so in particular, uh, we could have T correspond to background shading and create a data set that has this sort of, um, this sort of invariance by augmenting the data. Um, we'll also look at things like where T corresponds to dilation or erosion of the image and rotation of the image. Um, this will all be based off of the K49 data set where there are 49 classes. And after we augment them, we're going to kind of synthetically create this long tail distribution where for the smaller classes, we have less data than for, the, um, than for some bigger classes. Great, um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, once we create this, this long tail data set, we're going to train models on it and then measure the invariance of those models with respect to the class size. And in particular, we'll look at um, invariance to T, lower is going to be better. And the way that we're gonna measure invariance is we're going to measure the KL divergence between the um, predicted label distribution of the untransformed example 
versus the predicted label distribution of the transformed example. So how much do the, the label predictions agree between the, when you apply this transformation to the image? And we'll look at this as a function of the class size. And in particular, what we see is that, I guess first, if it were fully invariant to T, we would expect to see kind of a horizontal line across all of these plots. And instead, what we see is that for the classes that have a lot of examples, they are quite invariant to T. However, as you have fewer examples per class, your invariance gets substantially worse. Um, and we see this trend consistently across all three of these data sets. We also note that uh, a model trained with delayed resampling, which tries to resample the distribution up to the uniform distribution, um, this does improve invariance, but it's still, we still see this trend that the invariance gets worse as you have less data per class. Great, so now that we've verified this hypothesis, and really the evidence here suggests that invariances are not transferred across classes, what we could try to do is develop a method that encourages the model to transfer invariances from head classes to tail classes. And we developed a really simple approach for, for doing this and then wanted to test whether this actually improves performance. Um, this approach isn't necessarily anything groundbreaking or new, um, but it is going to explicitly try to transfer invariances from the head to the tail. And in particular, we're going to first just train a conditional generative model to estimate these transformations T. Um, there are actually prior works that try to learn these kinds of uh, transform transformations. Um, usually they assume that you have paired data of like the exact example with and without the transformation. In this case, we're just going to assume that we have the original data set, the long tail data set, and train this conditional generative model to essentially produce images from the same class. And then once we have this generative model, we can use this to augment the small classes. Uh, and so as a result, if we train this model on the entire data set and then augment the small classes, we're effectively going to be transferring these invariances in a very explicit way to the small classes. Um, it's also worth mentioning there are also prior works that use kind of learned data augmentation to improve performance. Um, here, we're really gonna be focusing on this invariance transfer problem. Um, if you look at some examples of what this conditional generative model looks like, um, here are some examples on the background data set where the largest class, um, here are some generated samples that are augmenting this example. And we also see that it does a reasonable job at augmenting even the smallest class as well. Um, and this means that even though it was trained on an imbalanced data set, uh, this generative model is actually pretty good at uh, generalizing across these classes. Um, we also look at another example. This is from the um, German traffic signs benchmark. Uh, and we also see that it's able to produce reasonable uh, generations of, of variations on the both the largest class and the smallest class. Okay, um, so then our, our first question when actually testing this approach is, does it improve invariance on the small classes? And so again, we'll look at invariance with respect to the number of examples per class. And we see that it, um, it actually does improve invariance for these smaller classes. So we see this green line is more flat than the other two lines. So yes, um, it improves invariance. We also see that it worsens invariance on the well-represented classes. And this is likely because the generative model is imperfect. Uh, it doesn't feel, like perfectly represent the transformation T. Um, great. So then, as a result of this, we can essentially use um, this invariance transfer and only apply the augmentation to the small classes to prevent it from worsening invariance on the large classes. Great. And then, of course, um, the last question is, do these improvements in invariance actually translate into better balanced accuracy? And we can measure balanced accuracy on um, different data sets. We'll start with the K49 data set. Um, and we see that compared to kind of cross entropy with this delayed resampling method, we can uh, kind of improve performance by seven to 10% with this more recent method that introduces a new loss function that's particularly suited for long tail distributions. We also see an improvement where we use this invariance transfer um, in this case by four to 6%. Um, so overall, we see a four to 10% improvement on these K49 data sets. Of course, these data sets are super simple. So we also looked at GTSRB and CIFAR. 
uh, long tail versions of each of these data sets. Um, and across the board here, we see a one to 10% improvement on these data sets as well. Um, the largest improvements are on GTSRB. The smallest improvements are on CIFAR 100. Um, these improvements are probably small because the generative model um, has some room for improvement and it might be actually mixing up some of the classes when it's producing these generations. So the takeaway here is that um, essentially by explicitly trying to transfer invariances across these classes, we can significantly improve balanced accuracy. Great, um, to wrap up, I talked about how we can attain better generalization and robustness. Um, the first approach that we could use is to incorporate diverse data from other tasks and domains. If we have spurious correlations, we can instead prioritize difficult data points. And this actually produces models that are substantially better and substantially more robust to these spurious correlations than if we train in a more standard way. And for class imbalance, we can try to encourage the model to transfer invariance across classes. Um, if you think about the kind of corresponding inductive biases of these two approaches, we can essentially think of it as first the inductive bias that hard data points often don't have spurious correlations. Um, and this means that if we prioritize these, data, prioritize these data points, we'll get more robustness. And the second inductive bias is that uh, many invariances are class agnostic, and we should be able to use this to improve, um, improve robustness to class distribution shift. Um, great, I'd like to thank my students and happy to take questions. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, I do think we have some time uh, for questions. I'll ask Jan if he wants to take the lead on that. Also because Max Welling is supposed to be the next speaker, but if I'm not mistaken, I don't see him yet in the Zoom. So yeah, then we have definitely have time uh, to do some questions. Uh, Jan, if you don't mind. Yeah, let's take questions from the audience first. So if you have any questions, uh, please unmute yourself. I don't think that's possible right now, but I can enable no? it. Ah. Now it should we be can possible. Do it in the chat. I don't know actually what's the best way to do it. I think both are probably fine. Either unmute or, or ask it in the chat. So maybe I can maybe I can start a bit. So thank you for the for the nice presentation. I think uh, it's nice work that you showed. Um, so um, let's see where shall I start. So you chose to um, to uh, with the long tail. So you chose to augment your data. Um, have you also considered about making your network maybe equivariant or invariant itself instead of adding augmented data samples? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, in some ways, actually, I think that the, um, the kind of experiments with respect to this particular hypothesis, um, they suggest that this issue of this, of not actually transferring invariances across classes. And what I think that is nice about these experiments is they suggest a whole range of possible solutions. They suggest that we want to try to somehow enforce these kinds of invariances for these small classes. And I showed one possible approach for doing this, but there are probably a whole range of solutions for doing this. Um, I think the degenerative modeling approach is probably, it was one of the simplest things that we could come up with, uh, but in practice, it has a lot of downsides because considering generative models is difficult. And so I think that more discriminative approaches for encouraging and enforcing these invariances would be quite interesting. You could also try to put it into the network itself. And we do have a little bit of work on trying to learn, um, learn invariances that are um, kind of as part of the network architecture itself. And I mentioned that um, this is kind of the reference yes. for that where we're actually trying to meta learn yeah. kind of invariances um, or symmetries in the network itself. Um, and I think that's an approach like that would be pretty interesting to explore here. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned the generator, uh, and so I was wondering, doesn't your generator also suffer from the lack of data? Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, empirically, we see that that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, I think that there could be a few reasons for why. I think that in some ways, generative models get more data for free because every single like pixel in the image is like a data point almost, um, and so they might overfit less as a result. Um, the other thing is we are like 
unlike standard like ERM training, we are kind of explicitly building in this bias into the algorithm, which is that these invariances should hold across all of the classes um, with this generative model by incorporating the generative model into training. And that's something, that's a bias that isn't incorporated into, um, into like a standard deep neural network training. Right. Um, and so there that might one, be more discriminative ways to enforce that as well. But it can make use of, by, by discarding the class information, it, indeed it can make use of much more data then, it seems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're not actually, and we explicitly don't pass in the class label into the narrative model because we don't want it to overfit to that class information. Yeah, yeah. thank you. There's uh, two questions in the chat, and one is about uh, JTT, just train twice. It sounds similar to boosting. Is there any benefit in repeating this for more than two iterations? Just train twice. <laughs> yeah, so we actually found that if you repeat it more than twice, it actually doesn't do as well. Uh, and I think that the, while it kind of on the surface is very similar to boosting, I think the underlying mechanism for why it's performing poorly, for why it actually works is actually quite different. I mean, boosting, you have this more iterative process and you also actually ultimately end up with multiple models that, that you kind of ensemble together. Whereas in this case, we are only ending up with a single model in the end that is, um, that is essentially trying to be robust to, uh, to the spurious correlations. And um, to me, this suggests that it's actually ends up being quite different in mechanistically than, uh, than how boosting is working. And the follow-up question in the chat is that if the model wouldn't prioritize hard data points and anomalous or erroneous data. Yeah, so we actually, um, I believe we include this in the paper, but we ran some experiments where we added noise to the data and we tested how well it could handle that kind of label noise. And we found that it actually wasn't any worse than ERM. Uh, like it didn't, the performance degraded uh, in a way that seemed okay, uh, at least on the data sets that we looked at. And so it didn't actually end up being more sensitive to noisy data. Uh, and we have some thoughts on this, but um, I'd encourage you to maybe take a look at that, that part of the paper. I think it's in the appendix if you're interested in learning more. Yeah, I also had a bit of a question myself. If, so if the task itself is difficult, so let's say uh, you get 20% accuracy or something, or I don't know, uh, you don't do very well. Will this then still work? Or is, is it, will it then become more or less uniform more? Yeah. So the accuracy is quite high, yes? Yeah? About 80% or something that you get? Yeah, I think that we primarily tested it on examples where we can fit the training data reasonably well, which is usually a decent assumption in, in kind of deep learning land. Um, and I, I think that if, if you aren't fitting the data very well, then um, maybe it's too much to hope for to get good robustness as well. Uh, but um, we haven't explicitly read experiments there. I think we have time for maybe one more question and then we can move on to the next speaker. There will also be a discussion after the next speaker's talk. So there will be more uh, opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, there are a few more questions in the chat. Um, let's see. May, let the clarification question. If you were training a generator on the original data set and applying the, the shading, etc., or directly training on the augmented data set. Okay, no, this question is too difficult for me to understand. <laughs> we're, we're, training um, data we're training the generator on the kind of the long tailed data set. Um, and we weren't explicitly using any knowledge of, of T during that training process. We were just using the, the data set. Okay, good for your quicker understanding of the question also, and also giving the answer. Then, um, okay, let's, uh, for people who are interested, and uh, I don't know if you have time, uh, Chelsea, to stay a bit longer. I think you were on the deadline also. Yeah, um, I'll try to answer them in chat. I need, unfortunately need to run to teach a class, sure. uh, but um, I'll try to answer them in chat before I go. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on to the next speaker um, who has arrived in the meantime. Uh, Professor Welling is here, so I'll ask him if he can uh, unmute and uh, turn on his video in the meantime. Uh, there he is. Good evening. Good evening. Live from Amsterdam, uh, I, I presume. Uh, let me introduce you to the... Sorry? 
It's not a video recording. It's not a video. Yeah, then, there's ways we can test that, but I won't. Uh, let me take a second to introduce you to our audience before uh, you can get started. You can share your screen if you want. Uh, so uh, this talk is by Professor Max Welling. He is the research chair in machine learning at the University of Amsterdam. Also recently uh, became distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. Uh, he achieved his PhD a long time ago now, I think, in physics under the supervision of Nobel laureate Professor Gerard at Hoofd. He was a professor at UC Irvine and until recently vice president of technologies at Qualcomm. Uh, he is a CIFAR and uh, Edis fellow and is also uh, part of the founding board of Edis. Uh, works on a variety of research topics, including variational autoencoders, famously uh, graph neural networks, uh, equivariant neural networks, many other things. Uh, he is also the person who taught me machine learning in my master's degree. So uh, we're very happy uh, to host him here for this uh, for this talk, please. Uh, the floor. Okay, thank you. Well, that's good to hear that I taught you AI and machine learning. That's that's a great way to be introduced. Um, right, so I'm uh, going to talk today about uh, topographic VAEs as a visual prior, which I thought was appropriate for this workshop. And um, so here's some of the people that have, through the years, provided input to the ideas that I will present. Um, you know, I guess it started, uh, you know, quite a few years ago uh, with Taco Cohen. Um, you see his thesis here on uh, equivariant convolutional networks. In the meantime, uh, Maurice Weiler has also contributed quite a bit uh, to the field, and he has written this wonderful, very long paper um, that's quite accessible, even though it's quite mathematical, called Coordinate Independent Convolutional Networks. I highly recommend it. It's also very beautifully illustrated, as you can see here. And uh, I will show two pictures in this talk from his hand. Uh, Mark Finzi um, has written this uh, paper with us on um, a practical method to compute uh, equivariant uh, filters or bases. And um, so if, if you're unsure precisely about how to create your equivariant bases and you don't want to dig too deep in all the math, um, but you do want to efficiently get your equivariant basis, then I would recommend not just reading the paper, but also downloading the software. Um, and then what I'll be talking about today is work with my PhD student, Andy Keller, um, on topographic VAEs and how they can learn in an unsupervised fashion equivariant capsules. Um, and then uh, I will also show one slide on some work he did with uh, Quinghe Gao, and um, I think that paper also is presented at this workshop. Um, and that's uh, basically about modeling category selective cortical regions with topographic variational L encoders. Okay, so the overview of today's talk, and here is one of those beautiful pictures by Maurice, um, basically illustrating gauge equivariant neural networks, which is a topic I will not talk about today. Um, I'll talk first a bit about equivariance, give a very brief introduction about the topic. Um, this is also some kind of visual prior, obviously. Then I'll talk about these topographic VAEs, which are even more of a prior um, to learn to do unsupervised learning and find disentangled representations and equivariant representations. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so equivariance is something that uh, most of you probably have seen at this point. Um, so here's another one of those beautiful pictures that Maurice made, and this is a. Uh, a gecko on some kind of egg. Um, and so it illustrates that both you can do, yes, deep learning on eggs, um, but you can also define agrivariance on eggs uh, and geckos. And so the idea of agrivariance is actually quite easy to state. It is that um, if you have some signal on some manifold, that's typically in the computer vision, this is a plane, um, and you filter, uh, using your favorite uh, filter, then you'll get, let's say, some kind of edge detection like here. Um, now you can also uh, apply a transformation, in this case, a symmetry transformation on the object, which is rotating the egg. And if you then do your convolution, you'll get you know, another filtered image. In principle, this could be a complete scrambling of what you see here. There's nothing to prevent that, unless, you demand equivariance, which basically says that in this case, the filtered image you get here should be a rotation of the filtered image that you get here. Now that principle, 
will lead, as I will, will sort of try to argue a little bit more later on, will uh, build sort of structure into your neural networks, which Jeff Hinton has called capsules. And capsules are highly related to, um, to symmetries and, and equivariants, as I will argue. And as I sort of illustrated here, the idea of equivariance applies also to general manifolds. And some advantages of equivariance are, in first and foremost, data efficiency. You put some prior, some structure on your networks. And if the structure is correct, then you should use, you should need less data to, to get an, a, 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 a sort of a certain quality predictor. Now, in this case, um, we know that, for instance, encoding translation equivariance on a neural net will go from an MLP to a CNN. And that, of course, cuts down the number of parameters tremendously. And this, in some sense, you know, taking that one step further, instead of just doing the transformations, we're also going to do the rotations, as I will show, illustrate in a minute, um, which will cut down the number of parameters even more because it's a constraint on the filters that you can have. Um, the other thing is that it will provide a form of disentangling um, of your signal. And in, you could you could interpret that in some sense as pose and presence, which is something that apparently also happens in our brains. So there is neurons which encode for the presence of an object irrespective of its pose. And then there is other parts in the brain where the actual pose is represented. Now, these capsules can be understood as, you know, sort of trying to disentangle presence and pose where the total activation of your capsule is the presence encodes for the presence where sort of the phase, if you want, or, you know, in, in the representation or the angle, if you, you know, if you want, um, is going to create for the pose. Um, and finally, um, it, equivariance also provides easy patterns for the next layer to latch onto, right? Because if this part here, this, um, I hope everybody can see my laser pointer, but uh, if not, uh, shout please. Um, so if this egg here was a complete scrambling of what of this signal, the next layer would have to look at this and make chocolate of it, right? But in fact, it's much easier if this thing is a nice transformation of this thing, because then the next layer can also use an equivariant filter to, to detect these things. Okay, um, yeah, so in history, you know, so this, this technology was basically um, introduced in 2016. Okay, so a little bit more detail, what is equivariance for images and sort of what, what can we interpret as a capsule? So let's say we have some nice picture here um, of the Mona Lisa in this case. And so we will have, let's say uh, some eye filter and a mouth filter and we apply it to the image. And then you, of course, you get these detections on the image. Now, we will now uh, also introduce rotated copies of that filter, in this case, 90 degrees rotations. And so we'll sort of get three um, sort of feature maps or channels in this, in this particular capsule. So this will constitute the eye capsule and this will constitute the mouth capsule. Okay, what does equivariance do for us? If I rotate the original image and I then filter, well, what I will get is now sort of these activations, but now in the in the next channel, um, because now these rotated feature maps are going to fire. And also you'll see that the actual firing pattern itself has rotated relative to this. So we get a shift in the channel dimension and we get a rotation of the image dimension. And that is a slightly more complicated transformation than the one we have here in the image domain, which is just a rotation of the pixels. We also do shifting here through the capsule dimension, but that's still a nice equivariance, right? So we just need to come up with a transformation in this space. It doesn't have to be the same transformation as we have in a pixel space. So um, uh, already in 2015, um, sort of uh, Taco and I started to think about whether equivariance can be understood as a form of disentangling because disentangling is a very vague undefined uh, sort of concept in our field 
and many people define, define it as different things. One very popular one is statistical independence, for instance. So here we defined it as, well, basically we want sort of linear subspaces and we basically define a disentangled representation as a bunch of subspaces where the transformations happen inside the subspace. So you sort of rotate through a subspace, not you know, entering you know, another part of, of space, but you just stay within your, your own little subspace. And disentangling basically means that you create many of these low dimensional subspaces where things transform perhaps together, not, not independently or sparsely, but just maybe together in these independent subspaces. And other people have also published interesting work on this. So here's a paper um, you know, by Irina Higgins, and of course, the, the, the paper by uh, Jeff Hinton and uh, Sarah Sabor and Nicholas from, uh, then on, on capsules is also uh, touching on this problem. Now, the interesting thing is that these ideas actually go back quite a while, actually to the beginning of, you know, when I started to work in the field of machine learning in around 98. Um, and people were th thinking about, you know, statistical independence as an organizing principle for latent representations. And um, what you know, the the hype at that point in time was, was independent component analysis. There were entire conferences organized on independent component analysis, um, and people sort of had this idea that um, by you know producing, let's say, Gabor filters and coming up with priors on your model so that they will start to organize themselves topographically in a sort of spatial topographic way. So you can see that things with the same orientation sit close, but also the same frequency sit close, uh, the same spatial location, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, and so you, you, could, you could sort of argue that, that, that models that try to squeeze out redundancies um, out of your sort of statistical patterns are the ones that sort of eventually create these topographic uh, these topographic models, and this is also related to things like divisive normalization, topographic ICA, etc. And and these things have similarities with things that are seen in the brain. Um, so here we have, for instance, uh, orientation columns, um, and they also have these kind of nice topographic layouts. So these colors are orientations, um, and including these kind of places where you know, all these orientations are sort of coming together in a singularity, uh, which you can think of as a topological defect. Now, this is all related to um, higher order dependencies, which is also something that we will model in the model that I'm going to present. Um, and these higher order dependencies, you can see here beautifully in a wavelet decomposition. So in a wavelet decomposition, um, you see sort of where you have, you know, for instance, on this hair region, you see that there is sort of high energy in the responses of the latent variables, um, but the actual sign is very hard to predict, right? Whether it's going to turn out black or white is gonna be very hard to predict. So there's no correlation between these, these pixel activations, but there is a correlation between the fact that they're all highly active. And this is a higher order correlation and you see that in many natural signals. For instance, here is a signal um, that's about the stock prices, very different domain, obviously. So if you first look at the differences between stocks, you'll get sort of this. And then you see that in certain regions, you'll get a sort of a clustering of volatility is what they call it in this field. So if the stock prices become volatile, it's sort of, there's a certain stickiness to it. And then if they get sort of more sort of calm, there's a stickiness to it. And so you, you can sort of, without being able to predict the sign, it goes up and down randomly, you can predict the actual, you know, the energy or the sort of the, the amplitude of this. So um, here's one last uh, prerequisite before we dive into the, the model that I wanna talk about. Um, so this is the variation autoencoder. Hopefully I don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, so the variation autoencoder is a model, uh, you know, introduced by uh, Dirk and myself in 2014, where you have a latent variable Z, which is unobserved, you have some prior over it. You know, you can forget about this, but these could be class labels. Um, and then you have some generative model, like a neural net, that would predict like the parameters of a distribution from which you then actually sample 
the values of x. So here's a neural net in the generative direction. At the same time, there is a neural net in the recognition dimension or the inference direction, which starts from the pixels, which could be the data, pushes it through a neural net, and then predicts for you the latent variable activations and potentially also you know, your class labels. And um, so you can use this particular model as a stand-in for the true posterior to do EM training, expectation maximization training for this model. Or you can think of this model as a way to introduce inductive biases uh, through the fact that you can you quite easily model the generative process usually of, of a process. You can put your, your priors on, you know, on how the world actually generates data in here to sort of regularize your discriminator or your classifier on this side. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a bit about the topographic VA, which is the main topic. So you can think of this as, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a combination of ideas around equivariance and variational autoencoders. Um, and you can, it, it's, a, it's because it's a VAE, it's an unsupervised model, unsupervised learning paradigm. Um, and it, represent, it represents kind of a, a more complicated prior on, you know, on the activations. I'll come back to equations more later, but sort of in a picture, just for you to get sort of a first uh, feeling of what's going on. So let's say we have a sequence of images. In this case, there are just a bunch of sevens that we rotate and change in color. So there's two types of transformations happening at the same time. We're gonna have two encoders. One encoder is basically for well, let's say the signed activations, but trying to factor out the actual amplitude. Um, and then there is the other encoder, which predicts the energy or the, you know, the activation amplitude um, of the signal. And in this case, what's happening, and we'll come back to this later, is we'll, we'll sort of encode this once, and then we'll encode all of these guys sort of separately and here are all of these guys and then together you know they're going to average to some variable t which we're we can sort of easily progress forward but basically pushing along this kind of dimension here on a circle we're going to just move these these activation forward like like in an equivariance map that is you know supposed to then model sort of the future of this set of transformations. And then we can sort of decode back using our generative model. And here's sort of, you can see that, you know, if we do this process here, then, you know, it can very nice. So this is all the data that it sees, then you can predict the future and it will both rotate and transform the color um, as, you, as you try to predict the future. So here's some more detail about the topographic PAE. Um, so we have these two encoders right here. So there's one encoder for the Z variables, which are again, sort of the variable where we've, we're trying to factor out the actual amplitude of the problem. So here the correlation should be sitting in Z. And then there is the actual amplitude U, um, which is sort of an energy, which is, uh, you know, unsigned. We both predict Z and U uh, using a normal variation autoencoder uh, network. It's a Gaussian distribution. But we are only going to use the square of u because we, we're not interested in the sign. The sign should be encoded in z. We here we're just interested in the actual activation energy. And then we create these variable, these student t variables t, which are the, the z variable divided by basically um, sort of the u squared, but then sort of averaged over a local neighborhood. And this local neighborhood can be a local neighborhood in channel dimension, or it could be a local neighborhood in spatial dimension. And as we will see, it can even be a local neighborhood in, in time dimension. And so then we have these, these variables, which are sort of normalized, um, which, which distributes according to a student T distribution, because these two are normal. Um, and then, so that's our T value. So that's our T here. And then we have, given this T variable, we have a, a neural network G, which then predicts back X, right? So now we have an encoder and a decoder, and we can write down an elbow in the usual fashion, and we can train the whole thing. Okay, so I don't know, maybe in pictures, it's good to have a look here. Well, actually we're running out of time a little bit, so um, let me just move forward. So here is um, uh, basically, if we apply this model um, to just uh, sort of spatial connectivity, we're just gonna tell it, you know, make sure that you're spatially 
connected to your neighbors, not in the channel direction. Um, what you'll see is you'll get a nice topographic layout of your activations. And here, what is plotted is uh, basically the act, act, you know, the active neurons for particular images with particular things in it. So for certain places, for, for bodies, for faces, mixed and none. So you see the regions where these neurons activate. So here it's sort of better shown for the TV. And you see that there's even overlapping regions here where both the, a body and a face is uh, being activated, which, which does make a lot of sense, of course. And there's, so there is sort of a hierarchical encoding um, where you, know, you might have a region where there is a face and a cat, which might be you know, animate, right? It's gonna be the factor animate, both are animate. Um, but then there might be another one where, um, you know, big, small, and uh, you know, big and small are uh, being uh, sort of models. You know, they might be on the on the on the fringe of that, right? And then there might be faces where the face, of course, should be right in the middle of the face region, and the cat might be more on the boundary of it. So you get sort of a hierarchical representation of ob object categories of overlapping sort of smooth regions um, on on this sort of uh, representation space. Now, the, the big step I think um, we made is to also think about temporal coherence. And this has to do with something that's quite old already. It's called slow feature analysis. And uh, to me, it basically means uh, the prior is that we all know that the world doesn't change incredibly quickly. Like in a movie, this can happen. If you look at a movie, you can jump from you know, one scene to another scene. But in the real world, the world is very consistent and very slow to change, right? I mean, if, if my kid is, you know, playing in the garden, you know, it's not like the next second, you know, my kid's gone, right? It should still be somewhere in the garden. So, 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 so it, at the abstract level of representations, things should be changing very slowly. Um, even though I could move my head and the impact, you know, what I, on, my, on my sensors might dramatically change. So the question is how can we encode that kind of prior, you know, into our models? So, um, so for that, we sort of do a sort of a, a space time capsule. So we now have, again, similarly, you know, a Z and a U variable, but now we, we basically create this sum over activations, you know, backward and forward in time. So we basically create an average energy that is averaged over time using weights W. Um, and, um, and, and actually uh, better is um, not just averaging over time, but actually saying, well, the thing that's in the future should have moved a little bit further along the transformation that I'm interested in. So, and I know how to transform things into the future. That's basically, I have to roll you know, in my representation space. In, in my capsule, I should just roll the activations around. So what I really want to average is activations where in the future we've sort of rolled forward the, the activations, you know, inside their capsule. And when we do that, you know, we get these beautiful models that can predict, you know, in this case, you know, we have a prediction. So, so this is the actual sequence of fives changing color. And here is, to, until here is what the model sees. And then we ask it using this model to predict the future um, color. And so here we see it, it very nicely predicts the future color transformations. Here we have scale. Of course, scale is very difficult because it's not on a circle, so it goes from big and then suddenly to small again. Um, but still, you know, okay, here it, it's having clearly a bit of trouble because this is a weird uh, transformation. But then it's it very nice, you can very nicely predict scale, there's rotation and, and many other things, right? Here's a bunch of more. Um, you can sort of look in the paper where we do both rotations or, you know, and, and color transformations. Um, we also have another version of this, which is called predictive coding VA, which where instead of, we, we, we basically, um, we use the information Z only at the last time. And we use, uh, now we use the energy basically from further down the past. We thought there was a more natural model. Um, and we use this then to create our T variable and to you know, average over the future activations in the, in the denominator. And then we roll forward to predict the future. And uh, sure enough, you know, that, that also works very well. In fact, you could argue it work a lot better. So here we have the sort of the predictive uh, sort of t, uh, predictive coding uh, VAE, which is a lot more stable in predicting uh, future um, 
transformation transformed images than, than the original TV. Um, right. So then um, to conclude, um, so this work is really about forging a link between a whole bunch of concepts which are around in the machine learning and the computer vision literature, which is redundancy reduction, topography, equivariance, and disentangling. And I think they all sort of, you know, different ways to look at the same thing. Um, so we use these topographic priors over both time, space, and channels, uh, where we sort of connect things which are close in, in, in either of these dimensions to learn the unsupervised capsules sort of uns, uh, to learn equivariant capsules unsupervised. And this sort of is the beginning of a long-standing problem um, where, you know, instead of hard coding symmetries into your neural network, you can start to learn them from data. This is a question I, a question I get very, very often. Um, uh, what, what, what do you do if you don't know what the transformation is or maybe if the transformation isn't, even, isn't a group or something? So, so this is a way to at least use the structure of equivariance into your neural networks, but start to learn it from data. Um, so we have seen that our space channel time capsules can make predictions by basically rolling forward a phase inside our capsule dimension. Um, and so therefore information is stored in the phase, so in, in the work that I presented, mostly in the phase of the capsules, um, but you can also you know, have a different frequency for each sort of transformation or combination of transformations. And we haven't really worked at that yet, but that's certainly you can also encode information in the, freq the frequency. So it's basically, we have these oscillators, right? At every point we have this capsule dimension and it's, it's rotating. So it's kind of a, a, an oscillator there. Um, and sort of, uh, you know, th these oscillators are connected. And so in principle, they should be able to give you sort of waves sort of in brain tissue right, or artificial brain tissue, or maybe sort of blobs here that sort of move, you know, o over this piece of brain tissue. So in, in, in this, that, that would be, I think, the most beautiful thing that we have this microscopic theory of, you know, representations and sort of, sort of neural activations. But then maybe at a sort of more abstract level, we sort of get an emerging theory, an emergent theory of sort of blob-like activations, which somehow interact as some kind of particles or perhaps waves that sort of uh, trend, you know, move through, through our cortex uh, to sort of transform information. Um, and I guess with that, I am done and I'm also out of time. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Yeah, uh, so uh, I give the floor to uh, Jan van Gemer to host a little bit of a QA and a mm -hmm. if uh, that's possible. Before we do, I had a request uh, through the chat to turn on the uh, live uh, closed captioning, uh, which is uh, makes uh, this whole meeting more accessible for everybody. So I'll turn it on. Please don't be distracted by it. It's also not perfect, but it can help some people. So if you see uh, your words being transcribed, uh, you know what's going on. Uh, Jan? Yeah, thank you very much for the amazing talk, uh, Max. Um, so um, to maybe summarize some of the phrases that I heard you say, particles, waves being equivalent to each other, maybe you're scrambling eggs to make some chocolate, <laughs> I seem to hear you say. Um, if there's people having questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, maybe. I can do a warm up. Um, so I was a bit struck in the beginning when you said that, um, yeah, it could be division. So that means that things are on a plane. And um, yeah, okay. So if I look outside, um, well, then I see uh, projective transformations. And these typically are eight dimensional. And this was always a problem that I had with, with the group equivariance. So if I want to sample from this eight dimensional space to create eight dimensional copies, yeah, um, yeah, how, how should I do that? Right, um, so I think it's, it's, if you understand the group and you understand the representation, uh, the representations of that group, um, then you can get pretty far. The problem is I think that, um, what you see in an image doesn't transform according to a group because it's a projective transformation. So I guess you lose a lot of information, no? Is it, uh, 
so I, I don't know precisely if that's an invertible thing uh, because you might I don't know if you rotate something you might you might rotate something out of the plane and you might not be able to see it anymore or something like that right so it doesn't seem to be you know I don't know I know precisely what the you know predictive group does but um, it seems that if things are invertible and according to a group and you understand the representation theory then sure enough you can stick it into Mark Finzi's code and it will produce for you all the, the equivariant filters and you can just go go ahead and do that, right? Um, so what I argued here is that you should also be able to learn it from data. And then of course, that's completely general. So it doesn't have to be a group, doesn't have to be even, you know, uh, the, yeah. So it can be just a bunch of transformations that you're trying to encode uh, into your latent space. Yeah. So if I understand your prior correctly, so you indeed um, like these local space and time, is what you uh, exploit locality? Yeah. Um, is it? Is it? Do you learn something similar to the to the convolution, or is it? Do you see some links there, which is baked in, indeed, as you say? Oh yeah, that's interesting. So, um, well, you could argue you're doing something like harmonic analysis because you're sort of mapping it to sort of frequencies and amplitudes in these capsules. Um, what the you know whether you are learning something like a convolution is a little hard to say you would have to probably stretch the definition of what you mean by a convolution a little bit but um our locality yeah. i think it, it yeah it's convolution certainly tries to yeah. yeah there's certainly this idea that um well let's see but you so you want your filters to be local and whether that's happening here necessarily yeah, I would have to think about that, whether you, you can actually claim that the filters themselves become local. Might be. Are, are you using convolutional networks or is this uh, um, I think free? in this particular work, it was uh, not convolutional, but we certainly we can certainly make things convolutional. So we have also worked on the convolutional version of this. Um, it, you know, Andy has made it to work, but it wasn't easy. But uh, yeah, so it, you, you can do both basically, yeah. Yeah, nice. Any questions, please uh, either unmute yourself or ask it in the chat. So typically when I'm, when I'm teaching a class then people typing it in the chat is uh, sometimes closes the gap to the, <laughs> to ask any, any question. <laughs> So here I haven't seen it yet. So either it was very clear or there's no questions. Very unclear. That's also possible, of course. Well, if nobody else has a question, I may have a question going a little bit further into your slides. Uh, uh, back, sorry. Um, I, I, it's maybe a very practical question, but I've always wondered, I, I'm not aware of anybody um, taking the um, uh, group convolutional neural network and um, showing any experiments on, on like an image net scale data set. So I guess it's a simple question, but are you aware of such experiments and results? Image net. Um, I wouldn't know why, oh no, I, th I think, I think there should be. I, I would. I would have to look a little bit, but sure, I, of course. I think that. I don't know, really but you're not aware of any memory, inherent limitations but... or or somebody running into problems that were unreported. No, I, I think certainly, if you do the sort of a ninety degree type of equivariance, the overhead in computation isn't yeah. all that fantastic, right? It's like times four. Um, but then you know, depending on maybe you also cut down on the not the total number of channels, so it. I, it's certainly not impossible. I'm pretty sure yeah. people have done it. Okay. Um, now, you could maybe argue that some other type of representations, which are the irre irreducible representations, where you have um, steerable filters, might might be a little bit more computationally uh, hard. But I, I think it's it should it it should certainly scale to ImageNet type of things. Okay. It, it, yeah. Okay. I'll give it a try. Yeah. There's some some things in the chat happening here, so maybe. Yes, I think by now we've had some questions in the chat. Uh, Jan? 
So the um, said, are there works yeah. to learn the capsules for representations? Well, yeah, so that's precisely the topographic VAE, right? So the, the thing that I've presented today was an attempt to, the first attempt to actually learn capsules for representations instead of hard coding them uh, using group theory. Right, so in group theory, you'll just have you, your capsules are predefined. You have some, for some still some filter freedom, um, but the but the capsules are are predefined. Here, we basically we don't need to know re the representation theory. You don't need to know the group, um, but we just put in the structure that we would expect from capsules, and by just doing that, you'll sort of learn uh, sort of capsule-like representations in your in your uh, latent variables. Um, and so, yeah, so, so exactly, it, it's about learning the capsules, uh, this, this topographic VAE. And then uh, from what I understand, it seems like the capsules are engineered for the problem like the space-time capsules. I was wondering if it could be learned. Okay, right, that's the same question, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. So do you think this will be uh, data efficient if you learn these transformations? Um, yeah, so, the answer is the more prior you put, the more structure you put on your representations, the more data efficient you will become. Of course, you might run the risk of putting in the wrong structure, which means that you would be uh, sort of biased and you would might you might not get over a certain uh, sort of ceiling performance because you know you'll hit basically your your the, your inductive bias uh, sort of uh, that you know your your data cannot sort of fix anymore but um in principle the 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 more inductive bias you put in it the less data you need to train the remaining degrees of freedom and so that's basically what's happening here too we put we, we have a very clear inductive bias which which basically says we think that the activations in our latent representation should be you know spatially or channel wise correlated um and also over time, right? So that, that's the sort of slowness part of things. And, and that reduces the capacity of your model clearly. Uh, and if you reduce the capacity of your model, you'll need less data to train, you know, the degrees of freedom that are left. Um, Thank you. Some things are coming in now, I'm not sure. There's a question about uh, Stefan Mala. The, the scattering transform. Uh, comment a link to this. If you see yeah, a link it, to the scattering transform. I think it is, it is linked, right? So, but in the case of uh, Mala, um, he has a very special set of filters that he uses. I mean, I'm not even sure he learns the filters. Maybe his first papers are not even no. learning the filters, right? It's just a, no, bunch of, it's a fixed. Yes. set of filters and then maybe you, you you learn sort of a classifier on top of the representation so here the actual filters are being learned um, as well yeah, to you know within the constraint that they are we have to remain equivariant clearly yeah. is there some sort of connection between the continuous latent map learned by the topographical va and self-organizing maps so the Kohonen sum yeah. I, yeah, I, th I think there. That's yeah. a good question, and uh, I think there might be, you know, some connection there. Certainly, I mean, um, also there, you can argue that connections, you know, that are spatially, you know, close, they should sort of activate in similar ways. So it's, it's, I guess, a different way to, imp, you know, use that particular inductive bias in uh, into a VAE in this case. That is yeah, related. Yeah, you have to, I think, give the grid as a prior. Um, let's see. Um, what kind of nonlinearities are present in the capsules? Um, well, there's quite a few, right? So if you if you think about just um, so first of all, there's a neural network that predicts z and then u and then T is going to be Z divided by the square root of U squared. So there's a whole bunch of nonlinearities right there. And then from T, you generate back using a nonlinear neural network. Um, 
and then um, well I guess even if you would rotate forward through your through your capsules you could argue that's a non-linearity depends a bit on which space you think about but you have to sort of shift things or permute things in this space so permutations in some sense are also non-linear um, but yeah anyway so so I, th I think there's plenty of nonlinearities going on in this in this model. Did you try the scaling invariant equivariant in the system? I'm wondering how we can implement scaling. Yeah, so actually some of the plots that I showed um, did have this scaling uh, thing in it, right? So if I am I allowed to reshare here, let's see, if this works. Uh, so this one here, you can see it. So here there is a, you know, there is a scaling transformation where the O gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, since we have to sort of go cyclic, we then have to start from the beginning, go smaller and go bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, it, it gets a bit confused at the, at the sort of discontinuity, but then it picks up again. So yeah, scaling is certainly something that this uh, model can do, that's not a problem. Um, filters are fixed in SketNet, right? Okay, but the transforms look very similar. That's true, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, in the end, uh, is rotation sort of invariant filters. So, do you think of the community showing heightened interest and good results with vision transformers, which do away with the inductive bias of CNNs? Okay, what do you think of the community? Um, so first I should say that, you know, the whole equivariance story goes through quite nicely for transformers. So we did SE3 equivariant transformers. So you can, so the way I view transformers is as a special case of a graph neural net, but so the, the graph neural net has very uh, sort of general interactions between pairs of features to produce a, sort of a message, which is then being sent to either side, uh, a very special kind of interaction is you know the key uh, query kind of inner product kind of thing that the transformer does. Now, if you if you think of a of an image as basically a grid, then there's clear spatial structure. If you think of it as a point set of points, unstructured set of points, then you would like to have permutation equivariance in your point set. So per permuting two points should you result in a similar permutation in the answers that you're trying to predict. Let's say if you do segmentation. Right, I mean, it's invariant if you do like think something like classification, if you permute two points, but it would be equivariant to the same permutation if you would do something like a segmentation. So, um, so um, the so we so that's an additional set of uh, invariances or equivariances, which is under permutations. But you can also, you know, in addition to that, add rotation equivariance, for instance, under the group. SO3 or SE3, including transformations, but now just on the point set. And we've done that. So we have uh, SE3 equivariant transformers and we have SE3 equivariant graph neural nets. So all of these things exist. And I guess the, the only difference in some sense is where do you move from you know, a two-dimensional grid of points where you apply CNNs to an unstructured set of points where you want to be permutation equivariant. Great. So, on the dot. Exactly. Uh, thank you very much uh, for answering all our questions. We're very glad to, to have you. Thank you very much. Um, great. So, it is time for a break. Um, let me confirm that by showing you the screen that says break. Um, we will have about 10 minutes break and then we will continue with the uh, oral presentations. We have three oral presentations, so don't miss them. We'll uh, see you in about 10 minutes.
think we're just about ready. I see all presenters in the chat, so that's good. I've promoted them to be co-hosts, so they can share their screen and show their video when, they're, uh, when it's their turn. All right, I think it's uh, time to continue. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody's here. Um, let's continue with the next item on our agenda, the oral presentations. Um, we have three presentations and we have uh, 10 minutes uh, per presentation. Uh, so um, yeah, 10 minutes if, we, if presentation is done before that, we have some time to do questions. Otherwise, we have to move on to the next speaker. Um, we, uh, right after the oral presentations, we will have a BOSHA session. There'll be more details to follow about that, but you'll have, uh, I think, 50 minutes to uh, also visit the authors of the oral and the poster works uh, there to ask any follow-up questions that you might have. Um, so, uh, yeah, even if you don't get the chance to ask a question now, you, you can uh, always find the authors there. So I'll ask the first author, uh, Lorenzo, if he can uh, uh, turn on his mic and video, and uh, then I will stop screen sharing. Sure. Hello. Hello. You're a bit soft on my end. I don't know if it's the same for everybody. Can you hear me? Not yes, well? I can hear you just fine now. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Please uh, go ahead. Time? Yes, we see. Uh, yes, now we see your slide. All right. So, hi, everyone. I'm Lorenzo, a PhD student from Sabianza University of Rome. And today I'm going to talk about our work, Unit or Don't Use It, Benchmarking the Deficient Image Classification, uh, which is joint work with John Bond, Luca Yoki, and uh, Joaquin Bentler. So we are in the context of the deficient image classification, which is that research field in which we train classifiers from limited data. So a few tens of samples per class, in general less than 10 and more than less than 100 and more than 10. And we do not employ pre-trained networks. So there is no transfer learning from large data sets like ImageNet. So after analyzing the literature, we identified two key issues regarding this field. The first one is um, the lack of a common benchmark. Indeed, previous work generally use some sample versions of popular datasets without using canonical splits, so making it hard to compare against other methods. And also there is this risk of overfitting on natural images, since in general the experiments are run on popular datasets like CPAC-10 that contain natural images that we know that in general do not have data deficiency issues. And the second issue regards the lack of reliable comparison. Indeed, we noted that many times uh, previous work neglected the existing state of the art uh, and compared against untuned baselines. And by untuned, we mean baselines that use the default learning rates and weight decay that were optimal for the original versions of the datasets, but might be suboptimal for uh, smaller training sets. Indeed, just to show an example, if you train a wide rest method, 1% of the CPAC 10 dataset uh, with the default uh, parameters, you get 46% uh, uh, accuracy. While uh, if you use a smaller learning rate and higher weight decay, you can get 58%, uh, which is 12% points above the uh, previous result. So to address these two issues, we are proposing the first benchmark for the deficiency image classification, which is composed of six different data sets covering different data types and data domains. And we follow a strict evaluation pipeline to reevaluate eight state of the art methods along with the baseline. And we found out that well-tuned propensity is a strong baseline. Indeed, um, it ranks second in our benchmark only behind one specialized method, that is harmonic network. And that hyperparameter rate, hyperparameter optimization or HPO uh, is fundamental to avoid bias evaluation. Also, we notice that published baseline are generally underperforming, and that uh, a strong baseline is obtainable with very small batch sizes, so as small as eight, weight decay, few adopt for each data set, and smaller learning rates. Um, so talking about the data sets, um, we design our benchmark to be as much comprehensive as possible concerning data domains and data types, always keeping a balance with respect to the computational demand 
uh, needed to uh, evaluate a method. So we started from two popular academic datasets, the ImageNet and CPARSEN. And to this um, couple, we added CAB, that is a very popular fine grained image classification dataset about uh, bird classification. Uh, we also added Eurosat, that is a remote sensing dataset. Uh, EC 2018 that belongs to the medical domain, more particularly uh, about classifying the skin lesions images. And finally, CLAM, that is an end writing uh, classification dataset in which you have to uh, classify medieval skin. As you can see, there is no, in the table, there is no only RTD images, but also multispectral images for certain uh, channels or grayscale images for the case of CLAM. Um, in the construction of our data set, we mostly aim for training sets with 50 images per class, um, with a couple of exceptions. So for the case of CAB, we had origin, we use the original clip, so 30 images per class, while for E6, we increase the number to 80. And in this benchmark, we reevaluated data approaches uh, that were published between 2017 and 2021. And we selected um, those approaches that were originally tested on small or subsample versions of popular datasets. And we use public available code when available. You can see the list here on the left. And all the methods can be mainly classified into three types so, loss based approaches, geometric bias approaches, and architecture based approaches. And for more details, you can um, refer to the data. As I was mentioning before, Mm, we designed a common experimental setup, starting from data tree processing. So we use standard techniques like uh, channel uh, channel wise normalization of input images, and also data specific data augmentation, uh, like horizontal vertical flipping or scale sheet augmentation. We set a common architecture and optimizing. Uh, we use the well established Rasmus 50 for uh, all the data sets except for CIPER 10, in which we use wide retina. 16 inch, and we use as uh, optimizer stochastic gradient descent uh, with a cosine learning rate schedule. While for uh, HPO, we use a state of the art search algorithm, which is a synchronous hyperband with successive evolving um, implemented in the RayTune library. And we tune learning rate, weight decay, and box size, and all metaspecific specific additional other parameters using 60% uh, of the available training sets and 40% of the available training sets as validation sets. So moving to the results, um, first to certify that our evaluations are reliable, we compare uh, with published methods on similar settings. As I said before, uh, there, are, there were no canonical splits, so the um, evaluation is not exactly the same. But still, we can see that our evaluations are pretty close to the original published value. And in one case, we also got um, better performance, probably thanks to hyperparameter optimization. While for the case of um, the cross entropy baseline, we can see that we got um, results that are much better than the original one, um, up to 18% point improvement. This is the full benchmark, so the full results of all our methods. Um, and we can see that the harmonic network uh, is the champion of our benchmark and with uh, 68.70 average accuracy at the start, while the baseline ranks second with a very close 67.90%. And then there is a third group of methods uh, that follow with uh, an accuracy of around 64-65%. Uh, here, I just wanted to give you a qualitative picture of the computational demand. Um, so the total run to uh, the total time to run a baseline with a core NVIDIA V100 GPUs with 32 gigabytes uh, is around six days. So uh, a little bit more time to run HPO and uh, a little bit less to run the final training. Um, of course, as you can expect, ImageNet takes the image of the time to run uh, the same. So to conclude, um, we introduced the first benchmark for data efficient image classification, which is comprehensive with respect to data domains and data types. 
keeping a balance with respect to the computational demand to evaluate the method. Uh, our detailed slips are publicly available at this link, and you can also find the link uh, in the paper. Um, since the benchmark is public, uh, it will be possible to extend it with new slips or data sets. And in general, we propose a fair evaluation pipeline to evaluate the existing approaches. So we use a common experimental setup and a careful tuning of other parameters to give each method the uh, possibility of express its full potential in a practical situation uh, having a small validation set. And we found out that cross entropy has been largely undervalued in this uh, inference technology on harmonic networks and this the published baseline by large margin. So um, with the publication of our benchmark and training procedure, uh, we hope that in the future, um, it will be easier to compare with the existing set of the art to avoid misleading comparison with, with the baseline. And more importantly, uh, set the stage for future development of the other field. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Um, we'll move right along to the second presenter. And uh, at least I will definitely have some questions for you in the poster uh, presentation. So I hope to see you there. Um, yeah, uh, Artem Oskalev, second uh, presenter. Um, yeah, hi. Hi, please go ahead. Yeah, let me share my screen if I can. Yes, I can. Can you see? Yes, we see your screen. Yeah, nice. Hi, everybody. My name is Artem Moskolev. Uh, I will talk about our joint work with Ivan Sosnovik and Arnold Smolders from um, Yuva Bosch Delta Lab. Uh, and the topic is relational prior for multi-object tracking. So as title suggests, in this work, we're interested in multi-object tracking. Uh, so our task is to detect and track all objects in the video sequence. This is an uh, important task because it's crucial for autonomous driving, uh, for human-computer interaction, is also used in activity recognition and in many other fields. And it's challenging because uh, the scene can uh, be full of dense interactions, can be crowded, and it hinders us from producing uh, robust long-range associations. So a little bit of background. Uh, generally, we have two family of methods. The first one is classical offline graph-based tracking, and it essentially can be summarized uh, with the three steps. So you first take your favorite object detector, you apply to the whole video. Uh, so you uh, obtain the set of detections for each of the frame. Then you somehow connect these detections into the graph, and how you do that is the design choice. And then having this graph on top of this graph, you solve association problem. So this association problem, as a result, it gives you the trajectories. So the advantage of this method is that it can reason about the groups of the objects. In other words, the members of the group, they provide a prior about the positions of other members of the group. But this approach is also it's offline and it's not end to end because it's not clear how to put graph optimization inside uh, a neural network. On the other hand, we have uh, a modern state of the art tracking by regression approach. So this family of methods that can be, uh, they can be summarized in two steps. Uh, so it's really simple. Uh, the idea is to leverage the object detector. So you take your favorite object detector, you take the regression head of this detector, and you use this regression head to uh, refine the positions of the objects from previous frames. And uh, this family of methods, the methods in this family, they are online and they provide very good balance, um, speed, uh, balance uh, speed and accuracy. Uh, but on in the core of all of these methods, uh, it's also assumption about independent trajectories. So um, a brief overview about modern tracking by regression methods. So yeah, as I said, it's really simple. So you take your favorite object detector, you take the regression head of this detector, uh, of this detector and you uh, refine objects positions into uh, new positions in the next frame by this regression head to obtain the trajectory. And as I said, uh, all of these methods, they assume independent trajectories. So in this work, we start from noticing that independent trajectory assumption actually limits us from utilizing the priors about object positions. And if you look on this video, for example, if you know and you can tell as a human that there is relation between this couple walking or there is relation between this mother and child, if you know that this relation exists, you can actually condition the positions of this object based on each other. So here we can actually say that child and mother, say, will 
always stick together and uh, assumption about independent trajectory uh, effectively throws away the source of information. So to combat this, we propose a simple three-step solutions to condition a prediction of the tracker based on what we call rela uh, relational prior. And on the high level, uh, we follow a three steps approach for that. On the high level, we first uh, contract, uh, construct spatial temporal graph of track instances. Uh, of tracked instances, you can do that dynamically online. Uh, then we uh, run a message passing algorithm on top of this um, relational graph. And the result of this uh, message passing algorithm is what we called relational embedding or relational prior. And then we condition the positions, the predicted positions of the objects based on this relational prior. Um, so yeah, on top, you would have um, a backbone tracker and on the bottom, you would have your relation encoding process. Uh, without going too much into details, our relation encoding approach is uh, following. We have a simple uh, message passing graph neural network where the input node features are just encoding input coordinates. Then we compute messages between nodes. We aggregate the messages with graph attention. And by the way, we noticed that uh, graph attention is really suitable for that type of problem because uh, usually if you're interested in dynamic relations, uh, well, in context of, of tracking, at least, uh, you're interested in correlations in the motion and uh, attention architecture is specifically designed to handle uh, correlations in the input data. And then when you aggregate uh, the messages with attention weights, uh, you also update uh, the node features, uh, firstly spatially, then temporally. And as a result of this process, you obtain a relation embedding or relational prior. Um, so these are some results that we have. Uh, we use a baseline method, a baseline tracker, which is not aware of relations. It's a state of the art tracking by regression approach. And so we added our relation encoding module inside this tracker to make it relation aware. So we tested on two multi object tracking benchmarks on MOT 17 and MOT 20. And um, there are a bunch of metrics. Uh, so um, this first column, it shows the overall improvements. And as you can see on MOT 17, uh, we're able to improve by 1% on MOT20, it's almost 1.5%. Uh, 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 so yeah, also um, a quiet insight, if you're decomposed this matrix by localization threshold, you can actually conclude that the source of improvement for relation aware tracking is uh, the scenarios when uh, dense interaction takes place. So this is a typical example. So on the top, you have uh, the tracking with no relations. So two objects are moving. Um, we want to track um, these objects. And if the tracker is not aware that there are actually two objects in the scene, that uh, they always took together, um, it's not aware of these relations, it uh, just collapses and loses the targets. Uh, while when you have relations, you can effectively uh, go through this interaction stage without losing. Uh, the target without failing the tracking. Yeah. Uh, so we also analyzed uh, the relations uh, produced by our relation encoding module. So here we visualize some relations. So uh, these are just attention weights from our relation encoding module. And yeah, as you can see, uh, the higher attention weight is given to the objects which are, most, uh, which are moving close to each other, which are moving coherently or moving um, in the groups. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for a single question. If somebody wants to put a chat uh, question in the chat. Uh, let's give people a second to type a question. Uh, you can also unmute if you want to ask a question. It should be possible now. I have one question. Uh, sure. Can we apply this for also normal object detection if we can find the context, uh, object to object context relationship? Uh, do you think it can help also to identify, for example, occluded objects and so on? Uh, yeah, definitely. That's currently a direction that we're looking forward to. 
so indeed, uh, in some cases, when uh, um, in temporal domain in a video, if we know that there was an object and this object was connected to the surrounding somehow, but then the objects start to un uh, undergo occlusion and uh, like it's 80% occluded, still we can uh, recover uh, the position of this object based on the relations. So yeah, it's it's a possible direction we're looking uh, to this direction now. Okay, and following question, what actually this, is this, this relation? Is yeah, it is short. What does the relation encoder learn actually? Um, so it learn, uh, essentially I would say on the high level, it learns how to condition the motion of related uh, instances on each other. Okay, yeah, thank you. I can uh, ask a detailed question. Yeah, there's yeah no I can answer in the chat. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll ask the next, the next and final presenter, um, Thomas Anderson Keller, to uh, to speak up and show himself. Hi. Hey. Hello, hello. We can hear you just fine. And you can try sharing your screen. There we go. And... Uh, yeah, we see the, there we go. Yes, great, go ahead. Cool, thanks. Yeah, my name is uh, Andy Keller and this is work uh, predictive coding with topographic VAEs that Max kind of already mentioned in his talk, um, but I'm gonna kind of I just go over it from a different angle and uh, hopefully a little more slow detail to give a different perspective. So, um, I don't think I need to sell the motivation to everyone here. The idea is data is expensive. This is a Waymo car. Uh, obviously, if you have to pay for a car for every couple of data points you get, uh, you're going to try to reduce the amount of data that you need to collect. Or for labeled medical images, you have to pay a doctor to go through and label your data. Uh, it's very expensive, and so we want to reduce the amount of labeled data that we need. Um, so how can we do that? Uh, well, one thing that we know is that there's a lot of predictable transformations in our data. For example, for a single road, we know that the weather conditions are going to change throughout the year. Um, and so maybe we can somehow model those transformations. Um, furthermore, something that's kind of nice about these transformations is that they tend to generalize. So you can see for sets of different roads, the same sets of transformations apply. Um, and so maybe on any new road that we see uh, in the future, we know that we, we could imagine what it would look like uh, in the winter time as opposed to the summertime. Um, so a, an existing method which leverages known transformations uh, is that of equivariance. So you can see convolution here, which is equivariant to translation, uh, and the group convolution, the P4 convolution, which is equivariant to 90 degree rotations. Um, and these are known to both be analytically and experimentally uh, data efficient, kind of as was shown by uh, the first oral presentation here, the harmonic convolutions, uh, or the harmonic neural network was the, the most data efficient, which is uh, exactly rotation equivariant. So um, kind of like Max mentioned, we can think of these uh, feature maps of a convolutional neural network as translation capsules because they contain all, gosh, my mail is popping up, um, in all, wow, okay. I don't know how to close this now. <laughs> they contain all pixels corresponding to uh, different transformed, uh, different transformed translations of a feature. Uh, similarly, we can think of the four feature maps in a group equivariant neural network as uh, a rotation capsule because they contain all features corresponding to rotations of that feature. Um, like I said, these are data efficient. The only problem is that it's really hard to adapt them to non-group transformations. Um, so one way we can think of do, uh, a goal would be to be able to learn uh, transformations from the data and learn capsules uh, such that we can avoid this problem of uh, having to analytically specify the group to tie our weights um, to achieve equivariance. So what would learned equivariance even look like? Um, well, the kind of the goal is uh, for an observed transformation, let's say we want a generalized form of a group equivariant neural network like we had before. Um, 
we want our capsules to roll. So uh, for a rotating uh, MNIST digit, we want uh, our capsule to kind of permute three steps. So we, we permute three steps along the observed transformation, and we similarly permute three steps in our, our, our capsule representation. Um, so this is the goal, um, but what if, and we can imagine doing this in a supervised fashion by, for example, uh, encoding the nine, rolling our capsule, and then decoding a rotated nine, uh, and encouraging the network to match those two. And people have done this, and they call this like an equivariance loss. Um, but what if we wanted to do this unsupervised, such that we can just provide kind of sequences of images um, with transformations and, and observe what happens? Um, the, the challenge with doing this unsupervised, well, and, and in the sense of a generative model, um, Unfortunately, I guess not a lot, unfortunately, but I kind of have to work with generative models because um, I'm in Max's lab. Um, most generative models expect independent sets of features like a VAE or ICA. It expects all of your latent variables to be independent. Um, adjacent features here in one of these capsules are very clearly not independent, right? They're correlated by the rotation of the feature. They're correlated by the transformation, the underlying transformation. Um, so in some sense, they're first order independent, but they share these higher order dependencies, um, or in some, you can think of it as like mutual information. So how do we learn kind of first order independent capsules that have higher order dependencies? This part I'll, I'll kind of rush through because Max already talked about it. Um, but we can basically take ideas from independent subspace analysis, uh, topographic ICA, and the idea is that you have some lower level independent variables, and then you multiply them by these kind of locally, uh, locally correlated scales. Um, so we sample a U, we combine them locally to generate the scales, we sample a Z, we multiply the kind of local scales by the Z, and that generates these sets of correlated T variables, which we can call capsules, because you can see T1 and T2 here are entirely independent from T3 and T4, but T1 and T2 have a correlated scale, despite having their first order independence. Um, so why do we care about this? And how is this even related? Why, why would we think that this is a good approach to learning invariance, equivariance? Wasn't that what we were talking about before? Um, yeah, so the reason is I can show you some results from uh, the original independent subspace analysis work. Uh, and you can see those here. So each one of these sets of four features is an independent subspace that shares a common uh, variance generating variable. And you see that they are learning transformations to some extent. There's transformations of phase of the filters, there's shift invariance. Uh, little different invariances are being learned in these sets of features. And you can imagine pooling over these features gives you invariance to that transformation. Uh, kind of the core difference here is that um, the model is just kind of learning arbitrary invariances, and there's no way for the model designer to specify which invariances we would like to learn. So that's where our work with the topographic VAE comes in. Basically, we want to learn observed transformations. So if we present a sequence, we want to encode that specific sequence transformation into our capsules. And the way we do that is with this capsule roll operation in the denominator of our construction, uh, which is uh, too much to go into here, but please check out the paper or come ask me at the poster if you want to see the details. Um, but basically, we can encode partial sequences and then roll the capsules to be able to decode uh, kind of unseen sequence elements. So like Max showed before, we can do this for different transformations and also for non-group transformations like occlusion here. You can see that the network never actually saw the full image and then was able to kind of reproduce this three just because it knows what features look like when they're included and when they're not occluded. Uh, and it can easily transform between those two. Uh, kind of the most interesting finding that we have, I think, is that we train the model on separate color and rotation transformations. We never combine the two when we're training the model. And yet, if I present the model with now a combined color rotation transformation, uh, we can actually decode that new transformation nearly perfectly, um, meaning that the capsules that the model has learned are 
like a factorized representation of this larger transformation space, uh, which can be recombined flexibly. So we can combine color and rotation and scaling um, without having to learn all of these combinations. Um, specifically, the paper that we submitted to this workshop is the predictive coding with topographic VAEs, where we move this to directly a forward prediction uh, setup, meaning that we no longer consider kind of uh, future inputs when we're doing the encoding. So now this is applicable to kind of the online setting. Um, so you can see the TL is now only dependent on TL minus some value. And additionally, in the elbow here, uh, we're decoding X in the future as a function uh, conditioned on the, a rolled step of T. So before we do any decoding, we roll forward one place. And we see that uh, this is a significantly better model of uh, sequences into the future. So if we roll our capsules forward and then we try to decode, we see that we get much higher likelihoods than the original DVA. Um, and you can see that qualitatively as well uh, through these tr transformations here. So that's it. And feel free to come ask questions after this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, uh, right now, I say. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I lost the screen where everybody is. There we go. Um, yeah, so let me uh, again show uh, share my screen with you. Maybe one small remark. So that these harmonic networks that you mentioned, they're not the same harmonic networks that I thought and you think they are. <laughs> oh no, okay. I, I had a suspicion that maybe it was not. All right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, apparently, so uh, it's nice because the papers are here, the, the, okay, maybe we should do this at the post session. <laughs> Sorry, I'll see you there. It's fine. I can also say my thing, and then you can can keep talking here. I don't I don't mind. Um, so these were the presentations. Um, there are many more works to be enjoyed, uh, and a lot of interactive discussion, which we all craved for for a long time. Um, these are the twelve posters that are being uh, presented in our uh, poster session. You can find the actual posters on our workshop through this link uh, and this corresponding QR code. Um, and then you can join the actual poster session through this link that you should also be able to find on the ICCV platform. If you go to the workshop listing and then click on the Gallery link. Uh, so the link is workshopsday1.event.gallery.io. And note though that Safari is apparently not supported by this platform, so you'll have to use something else. Um, and um, yeah, we will have a, a, a poster session for about a little over 45 minutes, so until the next whole hour, whatever hour that is in your time zone. Uh, I'd recommend you to uh, to go to the gallery, talk to some real people, and uh, yeah, have fun. Uh, Jan, if you want, you can continue the discussion. Uh, but I'm going to go to the post session. I'll see you there. OK. Just FYI, I have also put the uh, links that are on the slide in the chat, so you can also follow the links there and find uh, the PDFs and the poster session. Oh, and I should add, by the way, I, I don't know if that's in time, any presenting authors, you should share your poster by sharing your screen. There's no separate option to host the PDF or anything. You can, as, as soon as somebody jumps into your, your poster board, you know, you'll find a button in the top right to share your screen, so that's how you can share the poster. If you have any questions, I'll be here for a while and then I'll be at the post.
uh, all my jokes were not recorded. Okay, I think it's time to resume. I th see people are streaming in again. Um, okay, great. I see Professor Nakumar is here. That's good. Um, in that case, I will ask her if she uh, she's already muted, if she'll turn on her video so that we can see her. Hey, I will stop sharing uh, the screen so she can share the screen and I will introduce her to uh, our audience. If that so is all right. Like... All right. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, yes. So, can you all see? Yes, we can see you. Yeah. And we see your screen as well. So, uh, uh, our third invited speaker today is Professor Anamashi Anand Kumar. Uh, she is the BEM professor at Caltech and director of machine learning research at NVIDIA. Uh, achieved her PhD from Cornell University. She was an associate professor at UC Irvine and principal scientist at Amazon, among other positions. Uh, achieved many awards and honors, uh, including an IEEE fellowship uh, and this uh, brand name chair professorship at Caltech. Um, among other topics, uh, she's known for her work on tensor algorithms, which are central to much of current large scale AI processing. Um, so we're very pleased to host her today for our third uh, talk. Um, you can take questions if, if you want. Uh, we have about 30 minutes. We'll have a talk right after, and then we'll also have a block for questions, so you can uh, do, do whatever you see fit, but there will be also more time for questions. But please, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, you know, great to be here, and uh, great to see this topic of uh, you know, thinking about inductive priors, right? So indeed, when we think about uh, learning uh, with relevance to the real world, uh, you know, the labels can be imperfect. Uh, we can have domain shifts. We have the long tail uh, behavior. Um, so there are so many uh, ways to overcome these uh, uncertainties and imperfections. Uh, you know, the prime, some of them I've uh, mentioned here, right? Self-supervised learning has become very uh, powerful. Uh, it's a simple way to Right, augment data and create own supervision and get really good representations. Um, and many times even beating supervised learning benchmarks. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, another aspect is thinking about the domain priors, right? What are the kinds of corruptions? What are the kinds of right structures uh, we can incorporate from the domain? And especially if you go to say scientific problems like partial differential equations, which we've been recently working on, you do have the equation structures, right? So and other conservation laws. So that's another way to incorporate, right? So and regularization, we've thought about all kinds of regularizations, right? From simple dropout and uh, uh, right, to weight decay to indeed much more uh, uh, nuanced regularizations and also understanding the implicit regularization of stochastic gradient descent on other algorithms themselves. Um, and uh, perhaps the one that is still in its infancy is how do we use synthetic data to augment our uh, availability of supervised uh, uh, right, uh, data points. And there is the domain shift between synthetic and real. So how do we overcome that and learn uh, uh, useful information, especially such as in autonomous driving, which is very data heavy. And amongst all these are very valid um, approaches. The one here we're going to talk about is the inductive bias, right? So how do we create the right priors and create uh, hopefully ones that are bio-inspired, right? Uh, that are at least uh, inspired by biological mechanisms, even if not exactly mimicking what we see in the biological realm. And if that helps us also get much more robustness and uh, uh, better learning capabilities than the architectures of today. And so that's where the first work that I want to present uh, is this notion of having feedback, uh, which is very important in our own brains, and how can we uh, build that into neural networks and what is the resulting outcome uh, from such an exercise. Right, so this is uh, right now, in fact, also a topic of very intensive study in neuroscience. Uh, Doris Sao, uh, who is a co-author in this work, uh, is one of the world's experts in understanding uh, these feedback mechanisms uh, in uh, primate brain and ultimately our own brain uh, itself. And what we see main by feedback here is the uh, ability to 
uh, also not just take feed forward information, right? Take from, that goes say from the retina into the visual cortex, but you also have information from all other parts of the brain, right? Like the IT cortex. So uh, we have a certain internal model or representation of the world and that is being combined with the feed forward mechanism. So there is this additional feedback uh, that fills in the gap or tries to modify what we see from the external world. Um, and in fact, this is um, hypothesized to be really important uh, for foreground background separation, meaning what is in the foreground versus what's in the background, right? Uh, we are able to see objects as a whole. We are able to uh, reason uh, what is the foreground and background. And uh, this is primarily due to the availability of feedback. So without feedback, we wouldn't be able to make this separation. And given that this is so pivotal to our own perception, our question is, can we build that into also neural net, artificial neural networks? Um, because the current neural networks are only feed forward. They just take the image and in one shot, just tell you what's in the image or you know, do certain task on the image, right? But that's not how our, our own brain works, right? There is the continuous feedback and uh, in fact many mental health conditions arise from that imbalance between the feed forward and the feedback step uh, for instance uh, such as schizophrenia where uh, we are hallucinating and imagining things that's when the feedback becomes very strong so the brain is creating its own image rather than and ignoring the signals from the external world right so this is also very important for us to uh, also treat many mental health conditions um, by understanding the feedback better. So just a quick background on feedback uh, in the biological realm. So how can we abstract that idea and bring that into designing artificial neural networks, right? So this is that abstraction. The abstraction is instead of just doing one shot prediction on a given input image, we're gonna like also have an internal model that we will take feedback from. So we will have both the bottom up and the top down and kind of do this iteratively until we come up with a prediction. And the idea is if you start with a blurry image or some other corrupted image, this internal model ideally can denoise and tell you what's in the image, right? So even though it may not, you know, go all the way to pixel space and actually generate it internally, you have this representation that is denoised uh, because you have a generative model of what a typical cat looks like. And if this blurriness is stopping you from making the prediction, you can overcome that by uh, uh, implicit denoising. And so that's the idea. We have so many um, right nuisance parameters uh, that uh, lead that are present in the image that are not related to the task, right? So, and what we are doing in our right uh, multi-layered neural architecture is to remove these uh, new senses, right? So, ultimately, we are kind of losing information as we go up the layers. So, we can't trivially just do feedback and invert it. So we have to incorporate also this notion of information loss when we try to do the feedback mechanism in the top-down way. And that's where we introduce hidden variables that represent the loss of information that happens as you go up the layers. So the idea is this H is certain representation of the input, right? So it may not be in the pixel space, we have certain representation. And then we do um, iterative feedback around that representation. And the whole idea is, you know, in the feed forward step, we are going forward and um, right, this is the forward step, we are making a prediction, but then we also infer uh, the, um, these the latent variables, uh, which is the information lost as we go up while doing the top-down mechanism. And then uh, we can iteratively do these inferences and come up or to an equilibrium point when we can make a decision. So that's a concept here that, uh, you know, ultimately we want to have an agreement with our internal model 
what's uh, in the image, right? At the high level, that's our goal. So that's the notion of self-consistency. So how do we achieve this goal? What are the details and how do we build this feedback? And so the main idea here is that, you know, think of a standard neural network architecture. I mean, right, it could even be uh, something else like transformers too, but uh, we started with convolution because that's the most uh, right prevalent ones. Uh, but the main idea is in any architecture, there could be many layers. Uh, what we have is the loss of information, right? For instance, when you're doing ReLU, you are losing information uh, because you are like thresholding uh, um, right, the signal in a certain part of the space. So when we are now doing trying to do the feedback, we are trying to invert it, but because uh, that information is lost, there's also the hidden variable we have to infer while trying to do the feedback. And so by, you know, the idea is uh, with the feed forward and the feedback put together, uh, we are kind of like making our uh, rectified linear units and other operations adaptive rather than static, right? So it's like continuously also looking at the feedback signal while trying to make uh, the feed forward um, prediction. And so this is now the feed forward and the feedback acting in conjunction together uh, to enable uh, the uh, prediction. Um, so indeed, the you know this was in last year's NeurIPS, the details are in the paper, but what we see is that it greatly enhances the inherent robustness, right? So there is no adversarial training. If you just do standard training and you do zero shot evaluation of uh, adversarial samples, uh, what we see is that of course, with a standard architecture, with only feed forward, it drastically degrades, right? These are very brittle. And that's where now with the feedback mechanism, uh, we can see that it holds up to a much greater ex extent. And so this is the power of having an inductive priors, right? That uh, are biologically inspired that also add robustness to uh, without the need for adversarial training. And indeed adversarial training further improves the robustness. And the other thing that's um, very good with our own perception is few shot and zero shot learning, right? A, a child that has never seen dolphin for the first time knows that it's an aquatic being, right? Uh, it has eyes, it has fins. So that kind of reasoning is still not so great with the current neural networks. And what we are doing now is to incorporate these feedback mechanisms for few shot learning. And the idea is this feedback enables us to compute prototypes and we can like kind of train with prototypical losses. And that kind of gives you a notion of concept even with just few samples. And what we see is very promising results where after a step of feedback, we are able to improve accuracy on different instances um, because it's able to right, uh, improve the clustering much better. Uh, that's what we see visually here. Um, and indeed we see uh, on the results as well that the feedback is improving uh, over just the feed forward uh, mechanisms. Uh, and we are working towards enhancing uh, these uh, uh, improvements. And so the main idea is you know, we indeed want to combine with pre-training and other uh, self-supervised learning and other uh, good representation learning, you know, uh, techniques, uh, but the addition of feedback can help us uh, overcome the lack of data, right? So that's another regime where having inductive priors uh, is really beneficial uh, because we can do with less data. So robustness and data efficiencies are things that can be uh, greatly beneficial, that can be great outcomes out of uh, adding feedback and other good inductive priors. 
So I gave you an overview of feedback, right? I think there is so much there to do in terms of how to do the right architecture, how to combine it with uh, generative modeling. You know, the details are in the paper on how we show that you can think of this feedback mechanism as a generative classifier, right? So now we are also building a generative model. And then the question of what are good generative models that can also do good predictive uh, tasks right, to combine together is, I think, uh, a very exciting goal. Um, the other aspect that I think should be human-like is uncertainty estimation, right? So we are, you know, one aspect, an important aspect of consciousness is being aware of the surroundings and also being aware of our own capabilities. But that's not how current neural networks are. They tend to be overconfident, especially under domain shifts. And so how do we overcome this? And indeed standard approaches try to do temperature scaling or uh, Bayesian uh, formulations, uh, but you know, this Bayesian formulation tends to be expensive, whereas temperature scaling is simple, but under domain shifts, uh, they still don't work very well, right? So if you're in domain, it's okay, but if you're out of domain, uh, it is very challenging. Uh, and a previous work, what we showed is you know, by looking at angular distances for uncertainty estimation, we have a much more robust way to incorporate it. Uh, the angular distance is much more indicative of uncertainty than softmax, uh, which makes sense because the softmax tends to become overconfident uh, because of, uh, you know, being incentivized, right, during training to be more confident. So, Given this, um, you know, angular distance can be an effective one. But the one I want to talk to you about is this notion of distributional robustness, which is also to me a fundamental statistical concept, right? And, uh, and the question of how do we scale up to neural networks is the one uh, we pursued in this work. So what is this classical aspect of uh, um, distributional robustness? Let me take a very simple example. Let's say the training data had lots of different ap apples that are red and bananas that are yellow, right? So it's natural that the empirical risk minimization will look at features red and yellow, right? So you will kind of, right, if you only see red apples and yellow bananas, that's what you would use to classify. And now let's say at test time, I give you a yellow apple. Indeed, this classifier will say with 99% or so confidence that this is a banana because it has never seen a yellow apple. And this to me is a primary shortcoming uh, with standard deep learning methods, right? They only fit to the training data. They never account if there is something that differs from training data. And here we are being blind. We are not questioning, is this looking like training data or not? We are just blindly classifying it. And this to me is the primary problem here. So instead what the adversarial misc minimization or distributional robustness does is to first also judge, is this looking similar to training data or not? And in this case, it's an extreme no, right? Because this yellow apple never occurred in the source or in the training distribution. You've never seen it before. And because you've never seen it before, you want to then weigh your classifier according to this density ratio. So because this is very low occurrence, in this case, zero occurrence, you will end up with a low confidence um, classification. I mean, this does not primarily solve the problem of zero shot generalization, right? So in this case, what it does is saying, I don't know. But that to me is the first step. Right. I mean, if at least the confidence is fixed, then we can think about ways to improve zero shot or few shot generalization. But the primary problem is, right, you know, in standard networks, it's overconfident and we cannot trust them. And that's what this adversarial risk minimization or distributional robustness does is to fix the confidence issue by introducing this density ratio. And the idea is this density ratio, we don't need to use any kind of generative model, right? We can just use the binary classifier that tries to classify whether it's coming from a training or source distribution or target or the test distribution. 
You can also do this with, there is domain adaptation. You have a big distributional shift between training and test data, you can incorporate that. And so that's the idea in parts of the space where it's easy to say whether this is test data or training data, the density ratio will be not close to one. Right, so in those cases, it's low confidence, and then you have the classifier accordingly be having good uncertainty calibration. And so we can train all this end to end together, and that's what gives us the ability to seamlessly also incorporate this notion of how different is this test sample from my training data into our classification. And so we see good outcomes for uh, domain adaptation, but also interpretable density ratio. For instance, this train here is kind of a more typical train because it's not as cluttered compared to this image here. So the density ratio again is an interpretable notion of hardness. And that to me is also the important inductive bias we need, right? A notion of hardness that we can interpret. So I wanna quickly go through a few other ingredients I think are important uh, for uh, you know, being more uh, closer to biological systems and also having good right, inductive uh, priors in them. And that's the ability to do causal uh, discovery, right? So how do we do this directly from videos? And uh, the idea is again, incorporating structures like key points here. So if you're doing like key point detection, what you can have is a, then inferring a causal graph on top of these key points, and then you can predict dynamics after that. So incorporating structures like key points, right? And then looking at causal dependencies between them is somewhat akin to the kind of um, intuitive physics we have, right? Of course, it's... Uh, you know, still very open on how we have intuitive physics in our brains, uh, but key points seem to be an important aspect of that. And with this, we can do predictions on complex dynamics like cloth, right? And do cloths of different shapes, right? And the idea is, you know, this is all extrapolation. We are not training on those specific shapes, but the idea of like learning enough about physics, we can extrapolate. And same with like, say, uh, ball collisions, right? Even though you've trained them just between, say, three balls, you can now go this, or five balls here, if you can go and extrapolate it to other scenarios. And that's another thing we want, right? We don't want just interpolation. We want to be able to work on instances that aren't seen in training data, and the causal discovery becomes an important aspect of that. And so the other important aspect is being able to learn with structured losses, right? I think that's an important thing here. And so what we did in this work, Disco Box, which appeared in the ICCB main conference, is that you know, we're able to get these good instant segmentation, but the only supervision we have is the bounding box, right? So with weak supervision, we can train well by creating good um, inductive biases into our training. So how do we do this? So this idea is like being you know, able to train for multiple tasks, both instant segmentation as well as semantic correspondences here. Here you can see we can get uh, right, these dense correspondences. Um, and uh, so the way we go about doing this uh, is to, you know, for instant segmentation, create this multiple instance learning problems, right? With the bounding box, we can create the positive and negative backs and train with this. And then for correspondence, what we want is um, to also compare against different images. So we'll have a memory bank, and from that we can retrieve these different images um, for the same class. And then with a structured teacher, uh, which involves the you know, pairwise Gibbs uh, energy minimization, we can um, train for this um, uh, Hungarian matching, right? Or like a matching loss. And uh, then we can do self ensembling. So the whole idea is by incorporating uh, intuitive structures, right? We want this kind of matching loss and we want to uh, be able to 
uh, trained on like the multiple instance learning for um, instance segmentation, we can get uh, very precise uh, segmentation, uh, instance segmentation, as well as correspondences. So I encourage you to go check out the details in the paper. And another aspect which, um, you know, is not, right, we don't think of it as an inductive bias is precision, right? What kind of number system to use at what precision to use? You know, the whole kind of idea is let's try to use the biggest precision we have, but maybe trying to make it too permissive may not actually help you in learning. In fact, uh, it's again hypothesized that in our own brain, uh, we tend to store information in a logarithmic number system. So we only have like an exponential representation, right? So we don't have the, uh, we have exponents, but not a mantissa. And so then the question is, I mean, not just us, even rats, right? So a lot of like biological systems uh, tend to store information because the idea is it's very efficient in terms of dynamic range. You can have a huge dynamic range by representing it in the logarithmic number system. Uh, but the challenge of course is uh, how do we train a neural network in this representation? And that's where we use this notion of multiplicative updates because we keep them in the logarithmic system and we directly update there, right? Which ends up being like a multiplicative update. And um, we can also save energy because by keeping it in the logarithmic system and by approximating the addition there without doing the conversion, uh, we can save a lot more energy. And in, in a sense, this is also important for biological systems, right? Like by keeping it in the logarithmic systems, there's lower energy for storage as well as for processing. Um, I mean, while at the moment, of course, this is not biologically plausible, the inspiration from biology helps us come up with um, a good mechanism that stores with very low precision requirements and also directly does training on the logarithmic number system rather than having to convert them to the linear format and back. Um, and you can see that we can get the same results as the full precision models with just as little as eight bits. Uh, and so this is very promising and also lots of energy savings as well. Yeah, so to conclude, I think, you know, the aspect uh, that I spent the most time was on feedback, right? So this is so primary to biological perception. Uh, how can we start to build mechanisms that have this feedback? Um, and uh, what is the benefit we see is having inherent robustness and the ability to do few short learning well. Um, and then I talked about distributional robustness as a way to think about you know, is my test sample very different from the training data? And this is something we intuitively do all the time, right? Is this something new or is this something I've seen before? And so incorporating that as a module and training it end to end gives a lot of benefit uh, for um, not only uncertainty estimation, but downstream tasks such as for domain adaptation. And then uh, what we saw was causal reasoning is very important and we can use structures like key points to do that uh, effectively. And the I know, aspect of having structured losses in disco box helps us work with just weak supervision like bounding boxes and get very precise instant segmentation and um, correspondences. And lastly, I talked about uh, the logarithmic representation that is uh, very useful for low precision training. So here, I didn't have time to talk about the Bongard logo. That's uh, an interesting benchmark for testing human level compositionality and reasoning. I encourage you to check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much for the exciting talk. Um, I will give the floor to Jan to uh, Host a little bit of a Q&A before we move on to the next uh, speaker, um, if you don't mind. So. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. It's an amazing talk about uh, feedback, uh, uncertainty estimation, uh, causal discovery. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's the topics that the people should be working on. It's, um, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I had a question about the, the feedback. So I was thinking a bit 
so since these, uh, there was this proof huh, that these feedforward networks can compute any function. Um, so in, in principle, they, well, maybe maybe this is more of a question. Is it is it then true that they could also learn without the feedback? Or, or what does the feedback then give you? Does it give you then uh, data efficiency or does it give you like indeed, as you say, a prior? Yeah, so indeed the data efficiency is one, right? So indeed, if we, you know, have seen all the data distribution, then, you know, the universal approximator is good enough, right? It's approximator with infinite samples, right? You get everything. But the idea is in the real world, we can never capture everything, right? So thinking about zero shot robustness, uh, right? So you've not seen those corruptions. Uh, during uh, training time. So how do you still have inherent robustness? Uh, so robustness and data efficiency are the primary ones. Thank you. Um, yeah, if other people have questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Um, yeah, so I, then I can steal a bit more of your time because my um, I've also working a bit on this top-down approach and one issue we had is that these uh, convolutional networks they always scale down, so they do this pooling. Yeah, do you have any insights how to scale up, or should you you have this latent variable that uh, that yeah. goes back? Do you yeah, also then that? encode frequency? Sorry, encode what? Do you also encode frequency loss or some or something? Yeah, how to go from very low resolution to high resolution? Yeah, and that's a challenge, right? So, so the way we approached in this work was to, you know, like look at that base in perspective, right? Have latent variables and think of that as latent variable inference. Um, but we're also now looking at other approaches, especially, you know, can we have invertible models or models that are invertible in some parts, right? So can we then feedback becomes uh, easier than, um, so I think, yeah, there is not one answer, and that to me is an important challenge. Thank you. There's a question in the chat about uh, feedback, that the formulation requires a label Y and a latent variables. And the question is, could you see any way to achieve the same thing without labels, with just yeah. latent uh, variables? I or mean, we can be some... certainly do that with the self-supervision, right? So the label Y could be some self-supervised label, right? So it need not be the task label. A question about logarithmic weight representations. Uh, what about a different number system for the input images? Can that improve domain adaptation? Um, so the main idea here is, you know, if you're forcing to train on a small number of bits, it has to learn what is in a way it's like the bottleneck right so it's forced to learn what is essential um and yeah and the question of how well it does with uh, robustness you know like i think more extensive studies need to be shown there uh, we had a, we haven't checked that angle so far another question is about the density ratio estimation uh, do you need access to the target domain samples during training, or can the method also detect for an unseen test sample, whether it's for a distribution that is different from the training distribution? Yeah, so you, you do, in this case, uh, assume access to test samples, right? Because you're trying to classify whether it's like training or not, right? Whether this is from the training distribution or is this uh, away from it? Um, I mean, you could find ways to get around it, right? Because all you need is a find, to find a way that uh, this is not close to the training distribution. But at the moment, we assume we have access. And how, how do you, don't you then shift the problem a bit to that, uh, to, to how to estimate it's not from your training distribution? And isn't that then very difficult <laughs> to... Do you need to sample the whole world before you can say, no, I've never seen this? Or, or, uh, or do you need a one-class classifier? Or? No, I mean, there's usually always the target domain as well, right? We have the set of samples okay. we, want, we want to do inference on. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's like a transductive uh, yeah. setting. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Good. Any more questions? Um, if not, then uh, thank you again for the inspiring talk. Uh, you're very welcome to uh, stick around a bit. Uh, for more general Q&A afterwards, but uh, if you have to leave, we also fully understand. Um, I have to apologize, <laughs> you know, I have another meeting, but thank you so much and look forward to seeing the whole program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here for the, for the very nice talk and answering our questions. Uh, we will move on to the, to the final speaker uh, of today, Dr. Chubuk. I think I saw him here uh, and I'll ask him to also turn on his microphone and his Video. I Hello. hear something. There's there's many people, so I don't see everybody, but I, I see you turn on your video, so you must be here somewhere. Um, there you are. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi. Um, you can share your screen if you want, and in the meantime, I will uh, I will introduce you to our to our audience. Uh, so our final speaker for today is Dr. Egan Dobos Chubuk. Uh, he is a senior research scientist at Google in California. Um, he achieved his PhD in condensed matter and materials physics at Harvard and did a postdoc at uh, Stanford. He's worked quite some on a number of topics, but including uh, data augmentation, uh, for example, the auto augment paper, uh, and also recently the revisiting resonance improved training and scaling strategies paper, both very interesting works, I think. Um, so we're very pleased to, uh, to have him here for our, our final talk. Um, take your time, we have uh, budgeted uh, 30 minutes, but this is also the last thing we do. So if you need more time or want to answer more questions, that's uh, all fine by us. I think people will just leave <laughs> if it takes too long. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, please. Great. So I'm starting without a microphone, but let me know if I should put on my headphones. It's a loud day in SF today, but hopefully it will be better. Uh, so I just want to start by um, you know thanking the organizers. This has been a really interesting uh, set of talks and discussion today, and I'm very happy to be here. So I'll talk about how does data augmentation interact with our visual inductive priors that we're trying to give to these networks. Um, and I just want to start by answering the question, why study data augmentation? And um, you know, it's interesting. I started using machine learning as, as a tool to study physics. And one of the things that always came to me as surprising in my theoretical computer science classes was that um, it almost seemed like in machine learning, people cared about learning a function on a training set distribution and then applying that function on the exact same distribution for the test set. So the training set samples and the test set samples were coming from the exact same distribution. And I felt like this was never really what people want. So this was very obvious for me in physics. So right, like if you're trying to learn a set of physical rules, you want them to apply not just in the lab, but also outside of the lab. Um, but this is also true for engineering and for medical applications where the training set you have will almost never have the same distribution as your test set. Your demographic might change. The conditions in the lab are often different than the conditions in a um, target location. So for me, one of the most interesting things to study in deep learning was to look at how things change if you change the training set distribution or the test set distribution or kind of like um, play them against each other. And, you know, if you just change the training set distribution, this is called data augmentation. And in this case, you train on samples that come from distribution with some distortions and you evaluate on the original set. And in a crazy way, this sometimes helps your uh, test set accuracy. And the other way, other thing you can do is apply these distortions at test time. And in this case, you know, you might call this robustness to perturbations. This could, these distortions could be adversarial or natural. Um, but basically the idea is you wanna see how your generalization performance changes when you change the distribution that your test samples come from. And another reason that you might want to study data augmentation is it's been really useful. So like one to me crazy fact is that if you take ImageNet, which has 1.3 million samples roughly, which is a much larger data set than we can hope to have on most other machine learning applications, data augmentation can still help up to 10%. So I'm thinking you take a ResNet 50, Without any data augmentation, you might get something like 70% accuracy. And then you apply flips, crops, and maybe you apply something more advanced like mix up or random augment, and you know you get 78, 79%. So even when your data set size is really large, it's quite surprising that you can get up to 10% relative improvement. 
And maybe more importantly, data augmentation has played a really central role in recent advances in semi-supervised learning, self-supervised learning, and self-training. So if you look at something like mixed match, where mix up played a very important role, fixed match and UDA just use random augment directly. In self-supervised learning, SimClear has a set of data augmentation operations that made a big difference for their results. And in self-training, you might look at something like noisy student, which uses random augment or object detection. Um, again, you can use random augment or some something like copy paste to really support the pseudo labeling. And it also has some more niche uh, benefits. Like if you look at the batch norm free CNN training recently, there's been several papers that get almost as good results or as good results as batch norm without batch norm. But in these cases, you'll notice that you usually need very aggressive data augmentation. So if you take something like fix up or meta in it, it really helps you initialize well, which is one of the roles of batch norm. But you still need the other role of batch norm, which is regularization. So if you pair it with something like mix up or rand augment, you might get as good results as using batch norm. So given the, the fact that it's practically useful and it's interesting from a scientific perspective, trying to understand generalization better, I'll kind of tell you about our kind of history of data augmentation research, kind of how we try to improve it, how we try to use it to understand generalization. And then I hope to, you know, talk about its interactions with robustness, its interactions with batch norm. And if I have time, I'll talk about um, its interaction with how you deal with unlabeled samples, such as you would in semi-supervised learning. But I may not have time for that. Um, let's see. So, right, so data augmentation, you have a training set distribution that's a bit different than your test set distribution. Of course, the crucial question here is, how should it be different? Which operations would you want to use? And how strongly would you want to apply those operations to change your training set distribution? And for some operations, this is pretty obvious. So if you take something like the random flip left and right, um, this is a data augmentation operation that's been used for a long time. And it makes sense that you might want to use it 50% of the time. Because the idea here is your image classification task has this inherent symmetry where you can use the flip mirror of the image. And then in that case, using this 50% of the time makes sense. Another thing you might want to do is cropping. So again, if you have an image classification task, you can tell that this crop of a giraffe is a giraffe, just like this one is a giraffe as well. So you know you can use this kind of um, freely and get better generalization. But then there are also some data augmentation methods that don't make as much sense. So one of them that came out right when I was starting my deep learning research was cut out. And around the same time, another paper came out also called random erasing. And the idea here is, I don't know if you can see these patches, but you have these images and then you put patches in the images. You either delete all the information in those patches or you add some noise. And this happened to really improve generalization. And it was kind of surprising because clearly your test set doesn't have these patches, doesn't have cut out, um, but you were getting better results. And I'm happy to say that I think at this point we understand how and why cut out works. But then there's the next one, which is mix up. And this is, I think, even more surprising here. You're Instead of training on your samples, say Xi and Xj, you train on convex combinations of them. And then you set your labels again to a convex combination of them. And this seems like a very robust, very good data augmentation method. And I don't think we really understand why it works. And as I'm going through some empirical results, I want to kind of emphasize that um, there are two common beliefs that I think is often associated with data augmentation, and the empirical results don't always support that. So one of them is the idea that data augmentation only works if the augmented data is similar to the training data. I think this belief kind of started going away because of operations that cut out and mix up, which clearly challenges this belief. Um, but this was definitely a thought at the time when we were starting to do data augmentation research. And this, is, this might be one of the reasons that people were training generative models to augment their data and it wasn't, they weren't getting very good results. Um, so we'll have some empirical results against this belief. And the next one is that data augmentation works by teaching symmetries of the task to the neural network. So here you might think that, okay, so your task has mirror Philip symmetry, like we talked about earlier with ImageNet, but your neural network doesn't know that a priori. So you might want to add that symmetry to your training set. And this way you teach your neural network that symmetry, which ends up helping your generalization at the end. And I think empirical results don't necessarily support this view. I'll, I'll talk about this, especially in light of uh, flipping and cropping later. 
Um, but it's, a, like, it's quite a mystery to me. So let's talk about it together. Um, so when I first started working on data augmentation, we just really didn't know how to approach it. It was, um, it was quite complex. There was already some data augmentation pipelines people use, such as um, flipping, cropping. People would also use on ImageNet these random color shifts. And we didn't really know what to do. So we kind of did the brute force approach. Around this time, there was a very popular line of work, which was using uh, reinforcement learning to train um, architectures for architecture search. And this was led by one of my collaborators here, Barrett Sof. So we kind of took that infrastructure and just applied it to data augmentation. So we had an LSTM, and the LSTM would basically output data augmentation policies, which would then be tried by training a proxy task. The proxy task would usually be a smaller neural network trained on a smaller data set. And then the validation accuracy we get from this proxy task would be used as a reward to update the LSTM. And as you can tell, this is expensive because for every um, reward, you have to train a small model as the proxy task. But even though it was expensive and we kind of moved away from it since then, it taught us really important things about data augmentation. So one of them was that we needed a lot of diversity. So if you look at our best policy on image that we, that we learned from AutoAugment, we realized that we had to have not just one policy, but many policies. And to do this, we would have, say, in this example, five sub-policies. And you would uniformly randomly sample one of them. So let's say you randomly sample this one, sub-policy three. And this particular sub-policy asks you to posterize the image. So it's just a data augmentation operation with 80% probability and a magnitude of five. And then equalize, which is another data augmentation operation, with 100% probability and a magnitude of two. And then in the next epoch, you would again randomly choose a sub-policy, which could be this one here. So you can see that there is several layers of stochasticity built in. One of them is that you uniformly randomly pick a sub-policy. And then the other one is that for every operation, you have a probability associated with whether you apply the operation. So you could imagine over you know, hundreds of epochs, you ended up seeing the image in very different uh, views and shapes. For example, in this case, in three epochs, you would see it like this, and then this one, which is rotated, and then like this one. And to kind of test how the generalization performance depended on these number of sub-policies, we had run this experiment on CPAR-10, where you could see that with a single sub-policy, the best error you got was uh, something like 3.1, um, whereas if you, as you increase the number of sub-policies, the error would go down. And the effect was so drastic on the number of sub-policies that a single sub-policy trained with RL was only as good as a random autogment policy. They could just randomly initialize an LSTM and just read a policy. So you really want to have all those sub-policies. Otherwise, it was as bad as just not training your LSTM at all. And if you look at like the improvement on the accuracy, is just flips and crops on this task was getting 96.1. Full autogment was getting 97.4. But the random autogment policy was getting 97%. So it was clear that a lot of diversity was good. It was clear that we wanted to apply a lot of different operations. But the question was, how do we decide on the magnitude? Because as you remember, for each of these operations, the reinforcement learning was optimizing a probability and the magnitude. So to test this, we started running these you know, empirical experiments where we would take different size models and different distortion magnitudes and see which distortion magnitude was optimal for which model size. And here you can see that for the smallest model, which is a wider than 28.2, the optimal distortion magnitude for a single operation was around 11. But then as you made the model larger, the distortion magnitude would increase to something like 15 and then 19. And then here are kind of some visual indications of what these operations might look like for something like shear x, where 9 looks kind of reasonable, but then something like 28 really shears the image and really changes what it looks like. So if you were to plot the optimal distortion magnitude as a function of the model width, you could see that it was a monotonic function. It's quite noisy, so we have to average a lot of different random initializations here, but the signal is there. And seeing this, um, we had an idea that instead of using auto-augment, instead of using reinforcement learning, what if we just tried to optimize a single distortion magnitude, which really seems to depend on the model size, so that we could get the benefits of diversity without having to do RL. Another thing we were wondering in this um, direction was how does the optimal distortion magnitude change with training set size? And I wonder if anyone has any guesses or ideas here. This is usually a, um, I think, a surprising one. 
Um, so the idea is you can you know, try to find the optimal distortion magnitude of data augmentation, but for different size train set um, sizes, different size train sets. So what we found is that as you make a training set smaller, the optimal distortion magnitude goes down. So for the smallest training set size visualized here, which is 1000, the optimal distortion magnitude was around nine. But as you made the training set size larger and larger, the optimal distortion magnitude actually go, went up. And the reason I think this is um, counterintuitive to some people is that you would think that as you made the training set size larger, you need less regularization. And if you need less regularization, you would prefer a smaller distortion magnitude, but it's actually the opposite. So if you were to plot it again on this um, optimal distortion magnitude versus training set size plot, it monotonically goes up. And perhaps one way of seeing this is that um, when you have a very small data set, the amount of signal in it is small. So then if you add all the noise, the signal to noise ratio becomes too small. Whereas as you increase your training set size, you can actually afford larger and larger um, distortion sizes. So given these two observations, we actually came up with a pretty simple way of doing data augmentation. It's so simple that I could just write the code here. The idea is just you decide on how many operations you want to do per epoch, per image. And then you just decide on a global distortion magnitude, something like, you know, you can try five, eight, or 10. And then you uniformly randomly sample one of these operations, and then you just apply it. So this was a much simpler way of doing this compared to auto augment, but it was still getting pretty good results. And it was actually getting better results, even though it's much cheaper on large models. And I think you can see this by the previous argument that auto augment, because it's expensive, had to use a proxy task. And the proxy task by definition was smaller, both in model size and the data set size. Whereas random augment doesn't require a proxy task. So for something like EfficientNet B7, which is one of the largest models we tried, and on ImageNet, which is one of the largest data sets we tried, auto augment would get a small improvement, such as you know, 0.4, whereas random augment would get a 1% improvement because random augment didn't have this discrepancy between the proxy task size and the actual model size. So this was you know, really good news for us. We started applying this random augment to different data sets and different tests without having to uh, do reinforcement learning training, which was expensive. So this meant that we could also try it on something like object detection, where you could also do auto augment, which would be expensive and get better results, but random augment got you most of the way without any training. But it's, you know, I should already say at this point that it's quite a counterintuitive how these images look when you're training on them. So on ResNet 50, the optimal distortion magnitude with when you're applying two operations is nine. But for efficient at B5, it's 17. And for efficient at B7, the optimal magnitude is 28. So what that means is these images look like this when it's being trained on. So in one epoch, if you're applying shear X, um, shearing in the horizontal dimension, the image might look something like this, which um, I feel like is counterintuitively drastic distortion, but apparently it helps. And this also allowed us to kind of look at each operation separately and seeing how much does it improve the result when it's included versus not included. So we could, for example, plot the validation accuracy as a function of number of random augment transforms included in the list. And you could see that it monotonically goes up. The reason there's a big dip at one is one means you only apply a single operation all the time, which you know is not a good idea. But otherwise, as you apply more and more operations, the accuracy keeps going up. But you can see that different operations have a different kind of effect here. For example, rotations seem to be really good, but something like posterize or solarize actually almost seem like they hurt most of the time, even though when you include all of them at the same time, it's the best result. To understand this, we were trying to see why do some operations help and why do some operations hurt? And around this time, we were getting some other results on robustness that actually made the story more complicated. So let me give you a quick example. If you train with Gaussian noise, so you just you know add independent Gaussian noise to your input during training, it always hurts your validation accuracy. It always hurts your clean accuracy, but it will actually improve your robustness. Um, and by robustness here, I mean evaluating on something like ImageNet C, where there are these different corruptions. On the other hand, if you train with cutout, it always improves your validation accuracy um, on CIFAR 10 and on ImageNet under certain conditions, but then it would hurt your robustness. So it almost seemed like there was this. Um, seesaw effect where you improve one, but they hurt the other. And this idea that 
to produce augmented data that's helpful, it should come from the same distribution, kind of has a long history. So if you think about one of the first papers that really talked about data augmentation, they were using elastic transforms to mimic the hand jitters of handwriting. So the idea was if you apply these elastic transformations, it will kind of model how these digits might look due to hand jitters. And you know, they were getting an improved result here on MNIST. And then similarly on CIFAR 10 and ImageNet or object detection, we commonly use flips and props with the same idea that it doesn't actually change the label of the image when you apply them. So to measure how the interaction between how similar images are to the training set distribution and how much they affect the validation accuracy when you train with them, we came up with this metric called affinity. And affinity, it's a very simple metric. The idea is you take a model trained with no augmentations, so just a clean model, and then you apply it to data that's augmented by a particular operation. And the affinity just tells you the accuracy on the augmented data minus the accuracy on the clean data. So in many ways, this is similar to relative robustness. You just take your accuracy on the distorted data and then subtract your accuracy on the clean data. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, almost all operations have negative values. So an operation never improves your accuracy on that image. But the question is how negative? So the more negative the num this affinity metric, the less similar the distortion is to the train set distribution itself. And here I'm showing you the plot for you know, hundreds of these operations where we train with an operation and then we look at the validation accuracy or test accuracy on the y-axis. And the x-axis is the affinity of that operation, which means if you take a clean model trained with no augmentations and then just evaluate it on images distorted by the distortion, how much does the accuracy go down? So as you can see here, the x-axis is all negative. And I guess the point I'm trying to make with this plot is that you can have really good augmentation operations, which are shown by how high they are on the y-axis that have pretty bad affinity. And one good example of this is we already talked about it is cutout. So cutout will significantly hurt your performance if you apply a test time. But if you apply the training time, it's actually quite helpful. I'm assuming, I might be wrong, it's one of these points cut out. I think it's this point, if you can see my cursor. But then on the other hand, high affinity operations tend to be really good anyway. So here we zoom in in this uh, inset here, we zoom into this part where you can see that if your operation is high affinity, it's very likely to improve your generalization. So I think this kind of shows that like, you don't have to have high affinity operation to be helpful. But if you do have a high affinity operation, it's usually helpful. There are a few examples of this that's uh, kind of counter examples. For example, imagine taking your image and making just grayscale. That's an operation that has high affinity, but it actually has low generalization effect, like bad generalization effect. But this kind of a um, extreme example where making an image grayscale um, actually hurts your you know, training performance. And so maybe we can talk about these two beliefs that I was talking about. So this clearly shows, right, that the first belief isn't necessarily correct, that the data augmentations that are helpful have to produce images that come from the same training set distribution as your original set. That's not correct because you can have low affinity operations and still get a good result. And the next one that I find quite interesting is if you look at the highest affinity operations, the highest affinity operations, like if I were to focus on two of them are flipping left, right, and cropping. So what that means is if you take a model that's trained with no data augmentations and then apply it on a validation set that's been flipped, your accuracy almost goes down by zero. Like it doesn't change at all. So what that means to me is your neural network is already robust to that particular operation. Like it already knows that um, that symmetry exists in data such that it doesn't have to change the label. And this is also true for cropping. So if you like on CIFAR 10, what we mean by cropping is, you know, you just translate the image left, right, up or down. Um, on image that is more of a real crop. Again, the affinity is really high. So what that means is these models are actually already pretty robust to these symmetries, but somehow they benefit quite a bit if you train with them. So this, I think, a quite interesting mystery that I'm not sure I understand yet. And you know, this is one dimension I showed you, which is affinity. And then another dimension that seems to be important for telling whether a data augmentation policy will be helpful is um, what we call diversity. And it's kind of, you measure it, the, the best way to measure it is you train a 
neural network with the distortion, and then you look at this training loss at the end. So this is basically measuring how much of a regularizer it is. And what you find for a lot of data augmentation operations or their combinations is that they get better as you get moved towards the upper right corner. So as you increase your affinity, it's a good thing. As you increase your diversity, it's a good thing. And the best ones live in this quadrant. So these three stars here are the best data augmentation policies that we evaluated. Um, one of them is mixed up, one of them is random augment, and one of them is auto augment. And you can see that they have lowish affinity because it's like a lot of these drastic operations, but then their diversity is so high that they help. Whereas points here, you can see, which have very uh, bluish color, which means like they take your neural network to a low test accuracy when you train with them. They tend to be low affinity, but also low diversity. So they can be something like Gaussian noise here, which won't help your um, validation accuracy. And the reason I said diversity behaves like a regularizer is you can kind of play some interesting games with them. For example, if you were to train with um, one of these high diversity augmentations, such as um, flipping upside down. So if you think about flipping upside down, it's not a helpful operation because your data doesn't really have this flipping upside down symmetry. Like your label may not change, but your data doesn't actually have any of the images that are flipped. So if you train with that particular distortion, you actually get a pretty bad validation accuracy, which you can see by this um, light blue color. But one thing you can do, which you can do with regularizers in general, is you can apply the augmentation for a bit and then turn it off. And then what happens is your accuracy was pretty low, but then as soon as you turned it off, it actually shoots up. And then it ends up in a higher place. So you could also do this not just with augmentations, but with different regularizers, such as uh, L2 non-regularizer, kind of like a weight decay. Or you can do this with just you know dropping the learning rate, where the high learning rate counts as a regularizer. So if you kind of look at all these operations that, when applied the whole time, hurt your generalization, so those will be all of these points that are to the left of the dashed purple line. When you turn them off at some point during training, usually like somewhere in the middle, they get much better. And some of them get even better than no augmentation. So this is quite interesting to me. And we don't really understand why the, an example is the flip upside down. If you don't apply it, you're worse off than if you apply it for a bit and then turn it off. And maybe one explanation is that when you have it at the beginning of your training, it's almost like a pre-training phase where it's helping you learn better features, but then it's not really helpful for your validation performance. So you're going to turn it off and that becomes a fine tuning phase. That's just the you know, uh, intuition. I'm not sure if that's what's happening, but I think it's quite interesting. And going back to this question about Gaussian noise. So I told you that we were quite confused at the time because Gaussian noise was always heard in clean accuracy, but always helping robustness. And we weren't sure why. And Karat was doing the opposite. And so here, if you were to look at Gaussian noise, it would be somewhere here. Whereas if you look at um, cutout, it would be somewhere here. So I guess from a empirical perspective, you could say, you know, it's just because um, Gaussian noise has worse affinity than cutout, but it's not very satisfying. So um, after more experimentation, we found this more satisfying answer, which was that um, natural images have this um, distribution of their information in this power law way where the lower frequencies have most of the information. And then as you go to the higher and higher spatial frequencies, they have less of the information. Uh, whereas if you look at Gaussian noise, Gaussian noise is um, isotropic in all frequencies. So it, as you apply Gaussian noise, you're basically adding as much noise to every frequency. So what's happening to these neural networks, we think, is that it realizes that there is a certain spatial frequency above which there's more noise than signal. So it just learns to be blind to that those frequencies. So it basically learns, for example, in the schematic, just to become blind to all frequencies where these uh, intersect. And this would explain why they get worse at clean accuracy, because you actually could benefit from the information in those frequencies at the test time for the test set. But this also explains why they might get more robust, because a lot of the robustness benchmarks have noise types that are on the high frequency range. So being blind to them just helps you be better at um, ignoring the noise, basically. And one way of seeing this is these heat maps that we started producing, um, where the middle point is 0, 0 frequency. And then you basically have you know, horizontal frequencies 
uh, to the right and left, and then the vertical frequencies, which are like the uh, vertical spatial frequencies. And if you take a naturally trained image and then apply noise, so imagine taking Gaussian noise and projecting it to different uh, Fourier components, this is how it affects the performance. So if you apply these um, noise types to the low frequencies, the error rate doesn't go up as much as if you apply it to these higher frequencies. Whereas if you take a model trained with Gaussian noise or adversarial noise, as I mentioned before, since Gaussian noise and adversarial noise kind of make you blind to high frequency information, you basically don't suffer any loss in accuracy if your noise is applied at these high frequencies. You can kind of see because of like that blue uh, framing here for Gaussian noise and adversarial noise, they almost become blind to them. They don't really get affected by them. And we can also do this for cutout. Uh, we did this at a similar paper at the same time, where if you look at, for example, how sensitive the initial layers are over CNN, or if you look at how much the test error increases, if you apply Gaussian noise projected to these high dimensional uh, Fourier components, sorry, high frequency Fourier components, you notice that models trained with cutout become extra sensitive to high frequency information. And this might actually be intuitive because when you apply cutout, you're basically taking a chunk of the image and then you're forcing the neural network to make a decision based on kind of like smaller regions around that uh, cutout patch. So it forces you to kind of focus on higher frequency information. So you can see that it has more red on the higher frequency corners and the outer shells. Whereas if you train with Gaussian noise, you basically blind, become blind to these high frequency components. And this has been a pretty um, robust finding. For example, you can imagine that if you apply Gaussian noise, you become less dependent on texture. So you become more shape biased. That turns out to be correct. So if you want to make your models more shape biased, you can train with Gaussian noise. Um, for example, you might imagine cutout and cropping as done on ImageNet have a similar effect. And that turns out to be correct. So they both make you focus on higher frequencies. So if you are applying crop and then apply cutout, it usually doesn't help. But if you remove crop and then apply cutout, it will actually help you by two to three percent on image length. So this observation of how the spatial frequencies interact with these data augmentations kind of gives you pretty robust um, prediction ability about what to do for in improving your robustness or your accuracy. So going back to these um, myths, these beliefs, I think it's quite interesting. I actually still don't understand why these neural networks trained with no data augmentation seem to be so robust to these symmetries, but then they still benefit so much from these symmetries when they're trained with them. I think there's still a, a mystery to me, but um, we can talk more about it during discussion period if anyone's interested. So around this time, we were really happy because we figured out why Gaussian noise was making you less accurate, more robust. And we thought that we had a good understanding of what's happening. And then this paper came out by some of our collaborators at Brain. Um, it, it was called, I think, AdProp. The idea was, you know, they also realized this observation that was quite common that if you apply with adversarial noise, your accuracy goes down, but your robustness goes up. But they wanted to have both the accuracy high and the robustness high. And the trick they found that works is they had two batch norms. On the, on the normal batch norm, they would just train with the regular images where they, what they call X clean here. And on the auxiliary batch norm, they would train with adversarial images. And when they did this, they actually benefited on clean accuracy and on robustness. So especially for smaller models. If you see here, B0 is the smallest efficient net, B7 is the largest they tried. The B0 goes from 76.2 to 77.1 just by adding the adversarial examples on a separate batch norm. And their explanation was that the adversarial examples have different image statistics than regular images. And the reason they were hurting was because you were using a single batch norm, which was messing up the batch norm statistics. So this was quite interesting to us, but it also shocked us a bit because you know, we were thinking that adversarial examples hurt because they're changing your inductive bias about the spatial frequencies. Whereas this paper showed that if you just have a separate batch norm, now um, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have good clean accuracy and good robustness. But this paper was a bit confusing about one aspect, which was that the clean images actually used auto-augment. So the clean images were already actually quite different than natural images. And there were no experiments without auto-augment. So 
we want to understand this better and really get a sense for how the spatial frequency bias interacts with uh, batch learning. So to do that, we uh, did this extensive study. This was um, led by Amil Merchant, who was a resident with us at the time. He is now a PhD student at Stanford. And the idea was we, just like the AdProp paper, we had a main batch norm for the some of the images, and we had an auxiliary batch norm for some of the other images. And the results were, again, quite surprising and potentially very related to the spatial frequency bias. So what we found is that the ideal thing to do is to apply cutout on the clean batch norm and then rand augment on the auxiliary batch norm. And this kind of makes no sense, right? So if you really thought that what was happening is that batch norm has a certain image statistics built in them and you want that to be as clean as possible to match the test set, you would do basically no augmentation on the clean batch norm. And then you would do all your augmentations on the auxiliary batch norm. But turns out that actually doesn't give a very good result. So that's um, effectively the non row here. That actually gets you 1.6% worse result than usual. And then what you could do is apply flips on the clean batch norm, that's better. But surprisingly, what helps the most is that applying cutout, which is clearly not a clean, it's definitely not the same image distribution as your clean data, but it seems to help tremendously. So this helps on CIFAR 10, 0.5% above just applying random augment. So it's pretty hard because random augment is so aggressive in data augmentation, it's pretty hard to improve it by this much doing other things. So this was quite surprising to us. And we also try to understand like where the improvements coming from. So you can imagine first taking your baseline and then applying random augment, but then applying two different random augment batches. So some people get improvements due to this just by like increasing your batch size and increasing data augmentation noise scale. And then you can imagine having separated batch norms, but it still doesn't help you that much. And then you can imagine sharing beta and gamma parameters of batch norm that still doesn't help you as much. So what really works the best is having these different operations have separate batch norm statistics and applying cutout on the main and then random augment on the auxiliary. And then again, you might wonder if this means we can apply different augmentation types on the auxiliary. So one option is adversarial noise. So instead of applying random augment here, you could apply adversarial noise. And this is basically what AppProp paper did, which helps quite a bit. So instead of a baseline with adversarial noise, so 94.7, you can get a 0.5% improvement. Um, similarly, you might imagine something like AugMix would help because it tried to be more like training set images than the um, something like random augment. And it does help. But maybe it has actually more than random augment, which is a bit surprising. You, you might expect this to help less. The biggest improvement you get for this is Gaussian noise, um, which, you know, going to our previous discussion might actually be not surprising because if cutout encouraging you to focus on high frequency information is best at main batch norm, Gaussian, which makes you focus on low frequency information should be on the auxiliary batch norm. Um, and the fact that you get a 2% boost by splitting up like that is quite interesting, I think. Um, like, I think there's still quite a few mysteries here. I don't really understand how these are working, but um, I thought I'd share these as they're like quite unexpected. Um, in summary, I kind of first presented these two metrics that we use to study data augmentation called affinity and diversity. And we found both of them to be important. And then we found that data augmentation changes the inductive prior in substantial ways and perhaps unexpected ways. And one of these is spatial frequency bias which kind of we talked at length about. And then we also found that batch norm interacts with data augmentation and spatial frequency bias in surprising ways. Um, and I think we need to do more work here to understand how. Um, and I just want to have my collaborators here um, on these different papers, um, which has been you know, great to work with. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting work. Um, uh, Jan, all right, I assume you're still here to host. The final yes. Q&A, there he is. Still here, yes. Thank you very much for the very uh, nice presentation. Um, chat it, augmentation. It uh, has a huge effect. And it's, I, I like it the way you are kind of treating it like, a, yeah, I don't want to use the word neuroscience, <laughs> but you're kind of, you know, <laughs> you're doing kind of <laughs> like experiments on these uh, poor models. You're, you're torturing them and... <laughs> showing them images that don't exist and <laughs> ask them what they see. <laughs> but uh, it's very nice. 
Um, so people, um, if someone has a question, please uh, unmute or put it in the chat. I think someone has their hand up. So you can uh, ask the question if you like. Oh. Yeah, a bit soft. Okay, so yes. Uh, so I have a question uh, regarding self-supervised method. So have you tried your method uh, regard for self-supervised method? Because uh, as, as you may know, most of these methods, they heavily rely on heavy augmentations, like very aggressive augmentations and where data is, in my opinion, is very out of uh, the distribution of the data that it will be used. Maybe do you have any intuition why is that so? And can your intuition and your experiment help to develop some other augmentations or augmentation techniques like guidelines for self-supervised methods? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't done anything in this space, but we would like to. Like I, I agree with you. I think it's a really good idea. Um, like just some uh, data points that I can share is that in the original SimClear paper, they took one of our auto-augment policies and that didn't work as well. And I think one of the things they found is that you need to be more aggressive, as you pointed out, than you might be for supervised learning. Um, it, it's, it's a little tricky because when you do these um, self-supervised training methods, I, it's unclear sometimes how to really evaluate the downstream performance. Like there's been some work from Facebook where they showed that if you do SimClear type training, it improves your classification performance, but it may not actually help your downstream detection performance as much because these aggressive croppings they do, I think really helps you learn what they call occlusion invariance. So it makes you good at like focusing on high frequency information, but that can actually end up being not very good for you if your downstream task you're fine tuning on is object detection. So. For me, I would like to work on this space, but one of my issues is I don't even know how to evaluate a data augmentation policy. Like you can do self-supervised learning and then I guess you can do a bunch of downstream fine tuning tasks, um, which will be I think quite expensive, quite a few things to do there, but I think it'll be very interesting, yeah. I think there are some questions in the chat. Um, what's the state of the art for augmentations applied to 2D object detection and image segmentation? Great question. As far as I know, um, the like my suggestion to you to, would be to apply the copy paste augmentation. So we had a paper um, at CVPR this year, I think. We called it copy paste. It was led by um, T.Y. Barrett and Golnas. The basic idea was we would just take um, segmentation masks for objects and then paste them into different training set samples. And that turned out to work better than doing something like random augment. Uh, partially because like when you're doing segmentation object detection, you have this rich context, which is like you have objects and your background. So you can like copy paste them. Um, that seems to work pretty well. So that's, that would probably be my recommendation. Thank you. Um, adding more and more data uh, augmentation, the performance can saturate. To what extent can we improve the performance by using data augmentation? Great question. So, yeah, so I can tell you like some, some things that we learned on the, in this direction. So one of them is, as you're applying more data augmentation, you definitely want to train longer. So there's this interesting observation that if you're only training for like five epochs, you might even hurt your performance if you do flips. So even like the most obvious and harmless augmentations can actually end up being harmful if you're just training for a few epochs. But if you're training for a lot of epochs, then a lot of these augmentations become more helpful. So that's one thing. Another thing is you might want to reduce your weight decay. So one thing we found is that, and you can actually see a um, kind of extensive investigation into this in our paper called ResNet RS. We, I think it just got accepted to NeurIPS. The idea was we want to see how much you can push a regular ResNet and get the same results as like really advanced architectures. And what we found is that if you do aggressive data augmentation, train for longer, reduce the weight decay, then, and add label smoothing, of course, you can actually Im improve the effect of data augmentation. So those will be kind of my suggestions. Thank you. So I had a question about 
um, at some point you had a slide with um, where you increased the model capacity. And um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you can, yeah. I think you had, uh, you had a different, you have, I think you had like three, three models. And, and then you say that you, the, the more powerful your model, the bigger the model, the more augmentations you needed. Mm -hmm. Here, this one. Oh. Yeah. But I wonder, is the accuracy the same for all these three models? Or is the efficient model B7, does it have a higher accuracy? So does it, does it get uh, better? So does it need uh, more augmentations just to do a better job? Hmm. That's a good question. Right. So these models, I mean, this is one of the mysteries of deep learning, right? These models, the larger they get, the better they generalize. So you're saying that this is a confounding factor where larger models might require larger distortions just because they generalize better? <laughs> well, I was kind of wondering if the if the accuracy is also a variable, it also changed. So that could also, if you want to increase accuracy, you probably want to augment more. Yeah, that's a good question. I think there is an experiment for this. I haven't done it yet, but we can do it. So <laughs> the idea is, as you increase these model sizes, they saturate, right? They stop getting better. At that point, we can look at the optimal distortion size as a function of size, even though the accuracy doesn't change anymore. And that would exactly answer your question, right? Which I haven't done yet, but I'm saying it's a good idea. And uh, so you say, yes. So I've also read about this, that indeed that these large models, they generalize better. But then, yeah, okay, this overfitting idea is still, you know, going around in my head. So can you say something about this? I mean, Anything. The, not, only, <laughs> not only do they get better, and they do, as you said, they actually get better in a predictable way. And this really was fascinating to me. So usually as you make a model larger, their performance gets better as a power law, right? And this has been, I think, very well shown by OpenAI for language tasks. And before that, yeah. Baidu research had good results for this. But this is also true for images. So like whenever we try to scale, it's a little tricky because it's hard to scale the width by several orders of magnitude. So maybe we're fooling ourselves. It's not really power law, but it does seem like a power law. Um, and yeah, overfitting usually, right. So the, another complication here is you need to regularize better. This definitely came up in ResNet RS2. As you make a model larger, if they don't get better, it's usually because you didn't regularize properly. Uh, so it's all this like tricky game of like making it larger, figuring out how to regularize better. And then you never know if like you made it too large or just didn't know how to regularize better. So I don't know, it's an interesting question. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Uh, what do you think about the resize data augmentation? I think making an image larger leads to less sharper images, it's lower frequency. How will this impact model trained with this augmentation? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, I don't know to the answer to this question in particular, but there's some really interesting observations here. So like one thing is, right, um, you usually take the images from image that and you downsample them, like they're usually too big to train on. But then when you're evaluating on them, if you just use higher resolution images, which now means there's a domain shift from your test set and training set, you actually yeah. get better results. So this is already quite surprising that you benefit from larger resolution, even if you didn't train on them. Um, like in the context of this question, it sounds like they're asking if you make an image larger, not by, so you're actually taking an image that's at a lower resolution and then blowing it up. Yeah, I'm not I sure. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works. I don't know if anyone here knows the answer to this. Like that probably shouldn't help because you're not adding more information here, but. Um, have you noticed any effect of the type of interpolation used when applying different augmentations as a rotation scaling in a find? Hmm. Uh, I forget. Th this, this was definitely a question at some point because TensorFlow had changed the way they're doing the interpolation. Uh, I don't really remember, which makes me feel like the answer is no. But I'm not <laughs> I don't really remember any drastic effect. I do remember that there was some blog post. But I, I don't have a source for this, but some blog post where they showed that it was using something else and that was causing bugs and glitches for everybody. And 
that may be why Attila is asking it, but yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I should look into that. Do inductive biases introduced by a type of architecture, a CNN, Transformer, or MLP, do these biases interplay with the effect of a specific augmentation? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know. But the, so one thing that's been interesting to us to follow is that the transformer architectures seem to benefit more from more data. So like they really become competitive if you first train them on JFT or something. Um, so that's a really interesting question. And as far as I can tell, these models are usually not trained with data augmentation, maybe because they have such massive uh, data sets. And to that point, I think one of the, again, the confounding factors here is when you take a really large data set, like a 300 million data set, part of the reason data augmentation is not used is because it's hard to train many epochs on that data set. And then if you don't have like more than, you know, 20, 30 epochs, data augmentation doesn't help. So this is a great question to test. And I think we can do this just by training the transformer architecture just on ImageNet instead of pre-training on a larger data set. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I just don't know the answer. Yeah, this Thank is great. You. I, so many ideas for experimentation. <laughs> <laughs> People want to email me so we can like do it together. So I don't you know. Feel the idea. <laughs> yeah, nice suggestion. Yeah, and in Delft, I don't think we can compute, compete, compute, <laughs> compete with not, compute. Not with Google. <laughs> Maybe there's a last question. Um, have you tried any of these augmentation techniques at test time for test time meditation to see if they can further improve uh, recent work? Um, uh, it would be interesting to see how some of your augmentation techniques compare to the ones with us here. Another great question. So we actually did try this several times. This was definitely a thing we were interested in. Um, we could never beat the simple baseline of flips and crops. Um, I know that there's been several papers that were published and got accepted to conferences on this. And I don't know in particular these two links you sent me, I just can't open them right now. But in these papers, they usually miss the simple baseline of flips and crops. So I feel like what people have done, you know, maybe a decade ago, which is like when you're evaluating, you flip and then you take different crops over your image at test time and an ensemble, that seems to work really well. So we could never beat that with auto augment or rend augment. Um, but if there was a way to beat them, it would be really interesting. I, we just couldn't do it. And like since we tried it several times and failed, we just gave up and assumed that flips and crafts were unbeatable. Yeah. Good. Um, then I think it's time to end here. I'll give the word back to Robert Jan. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks again uh, to Dr. Tuok for the great talk and the interesting and uh, exciting discussion. And we look forward to all the works being submitted to next year's workshop <laughs> about uh, everything that came out of this discussion. Um, great. Yes. All right. So to wrap up, there's not really much more to say, uh, except that I will share my screen uh, one more time uh, for the, uh, the end slide of this uh, of this meeting. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. Uh, special thanks to all of our speakers for entertaining us with uh, all of the great uh, discussion and, and, and works that we were able to, uh, to enjoy today. Uh, thanks to the audience for being here and for participating, for asking your questions and for uh, joining us in the poster session. I really enjoyed myself today. I think a lot of people may, maybe did. Um, and we really hope to see you. Uh, we, we want to do this thing yearly. So we did it the last year, we hope to do it next year. Uh, likely at uh, ECCV next year, we'll, we'll maybe try or maybe some other place. Uh, keep an eye on, on our website. I think you know how to find that by now. Otherwise, you can find it in the ICCV Zoom portal, uh, the ICCV portal. Um, so thank you very much for attending, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Yeah, it's nice to see uh, people staying till the end. Yeah, captivating speaker.
Now I think uh, we can stop recording and start the virtual drinks. Yes, we can. Let me. Oh, wait, where, where? Let me find the end end record button.